Good morning, everyone. Um, I see all four of us are present. Um, I'm going to do a roll call just to confirm that. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Hi, right, good morning. I am here. Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. Good morning. Commissioner Zinica. Good morning, everyone. I am here. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for for um, attending this meeting. As you know, we're conducting it virtually given relief that Governor Baker issued pursuant to an executive order that allows public bodies like ours to gather remotely, make our decisions during this pandemic, <clears throat> which we now are um, you know, over a, a year at. Our last um, meeting was our one, one year anniversary. Um, today is March 25th. It's just after 10 a.m. and we are um, starting public meeting number 340. Before we get started, I, I know that all of us um, collectively have in our thoughts the, the victims of the Atlanta shooting and our, we remain committed to our um, values of equity and inclusion and anti-racism. So we keep in mind the victims of that Atlanta shooting. And then of course, the shooting in Boulder. Um, you know, we are safe in our homes working remotely. Our, our folks are on the casino floors, uh, the gaming agents, our GEU. We think of everyone's safety, but right now we will think of those two communities and keep them in our thoughts and prayers. <clears throat> um, with that, uh, again, good morning. Um, another reminder, much more housekeeping. We have a really busy um, agenda and uh, <clears throat> I'm not inclined usually to keep track of time. Um, Mary Ann does a great job at lining up a, an agenda. Today I will um, ask Karen to assist me in keeping things moving along. Um, and my fellow commissioners, if you need a break, it is a long day for us. Just you know, chime in and we'll make sure everyone's comfortable. Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien with the minutes on item number two. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Steph has been um, catching us up on these. I, I appreciate the work that they've put into this. Um, just as a general comment before we move into the two days, we had discussed putting timestamps at the beginning of each shift in topic. Um, and they, I would just ask that the, those be put in on these two dates. They're, they're not in there right now. Um, and then I had a, a couple comments on February, on de, sorry, December 3rd of 2020 before we move to have them approved. Um, believe at page eight, uh, there's two comments to me having to step out of the meeting. It looks like I stepped out twice and came back once. Um, I think it's the <laughs> latter, um, but maybe it's something to check to make sure which one of those is, is accurate and then just strike the other one. Um, but other than that, I would then uh, move that we approve the meeting minutes from December 3rd, 2020. That's a correction for any other typographical errors or not other corrections for non-material matters. Second. Thank you. Any questions other than we know that Commissioner O'Brien stepped back? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Sunica. Aye. I vote yes, four zero. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, and then the next set of minutes in the packet is uh, December 17, 2020. Um, and I had a couple comments um, before I moved to have those approved. One is on page three of the minutes um, where it discusses, um, we're getting the on-site casino updates. Uh, and at the end of the opening paragraph, there's a sentence that makes the remark that the chair, Commissioner Karen and myself provided remarks. Um, so I don't know if anything more specific or detailed could be put in there other than that. Um, because the other comments reference are a little more specific as you go through. Um, and then the last comment I have is page six of these minutes where we were talking about the MVET card um, request by Suffolk Downs. Um, and I had asked some questions at the end of page six relating to um, balances on the cards that were never bet and whether those were treated like unclaimed tickets or abandoned property. Um, and the discussion is in there, um, 
But I think what needs clarifying is that um, the question that I asked was seeking clarification that unused money was not going to be treated like abandoned property, but was treated like unclaimed tickets that ultimately would go into the purse account. And I just would like that fact reflected in the minutes. And so my suggestion would be um, at the end of that paragraph, which actually goes on to page seven, that it reflect that I, uh, Commissioner O'Brien sought clarification that any unused money um, was not going to be treated like abandoned property. And the answer was no, that all the money um, on those cards, if unclaimed, would ultimately revert to the purse account. So I would just ask that that sentence be put in at the end of that paragraph at the top of page seven. And other than that, I would then move that we approve the minutes uh, from December 17th, 2020, subject to typographical error corrections or any other errors for non-material matters. With those uh, modifications, I vote uh, second. Any further modifications? Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, your first point was one I thought um, I would have brought up, so thank you. Commissioner Cameron, are you all set? Yes. Okay, then a roll call vote. Commissioner Camp. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zinica. Aye. And uh, yes for me, four zero, and thank you. Thank you for the thorough review too, Commissioner. Okay, moving then right to um, the administrative update. Karen, um, Executive Director Wells, please. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Commission. Uh, the first item on the agenda for the administrative update is the on-site casino updates with Director Lilios and Assistant Director Van. so I will turn it over to them. Thanks, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. At your last public meeting two weeks ago, you voted on two matters that impact operations at MGM and Encore. You approved the addition of a fourth player position at Blackjack style tables. You also voted to allow the reintroduction of craps. Both of those approvals were conditioned on COVID related safety measures being in place. Our gaming agents team has been monitoring those rollouts and I'd ask uh, Mr. Band to update you on the status. Uh, yes, I'll first start with uh, the occupancy for the uh, casinos. Uh, MGM had a uh, high number was uh, 1861 on Saturday the 20th, which is a 23% occupancy. PPC's uh, high number was 1426, which is 24.6% on uh, which is also Saturday happened to be a uh, PPC cruise uh, promotion. Uh, Encore's high number was on the 20th, which is uh, 3,537 or 20.8% occupancy, which was a uh, um, mystery point promotion as well, uh, all well below the 40% occupancy level. Uh, as far as the, the new seat capacity, MGM's four seat uh, they have in place on 90 tables, which gives them 90 additional uh, seats to play at. That's going very well for them. Uh, they have not instituted craps at this point. Their uh, tables are ready for inspection this afternoon, which our agents are uh, going to be inspecting later today. It took them a little while to get their uh, plexiglass in order for uh, it would meet with our requirements. Uh, Encore. Uh, had tables ready. As a matter of fact, the afternoon after the meeting that uh, uh, you approved it, as well as their fourth seat. That added 183 additional uh, seats for play. That has been received very well by the public, as well as uh, seven uh, craps tables. Uh, that has gone very well. Only thing that we observed that a normal craps game gets about 130 rolls per hour. Uh, with the plexiglass, that's probably cut that down to about 90 rolls per hour, slowed the game down a little bit, but that's to be expected, uh, you know, with players getting used to plexiglass and things like that. No real uh, additional uh, problems to talk about. Uh, the casino's done a pretty good job of keeping people away from, uh, you know, kind of gawking at the table like uh, uh, you know, it happens with uh, uh, craps. Uh, only other thing I, I have to report is uh, our uh, complaints about not having poker have gone up greatly since since two weeks ago. Uh, everybody wants to know where we're going to do it. 
I will say Encore has done an excellent job on their website where under their poker section, they address uh, pretty much their whole stance on poker, uh, why they don't have it, what they've done with their bad beat money and everything. They did an excellent job with that. So, uh, you know, kudos to them for, for, for doing that. Any questions? Uh, just on the note, uh, Bruce, sorry, um, just on the note of poker, is, are, are you aware of other jurisdictions that have reintroduced uh, poker at this time? I'm curious if there's a quote-unquote safe way. A, a lot of poker. jurisdictions have done it, but uh, as Encore mentions on their site, that there isn't any way to do it to meet our uh, uh, you know, dis safe distancing protocols. Uh, uh, you know, we require uh, certain spaces between it, and that only gets you three to four people at a table, which does not make the game of poker profitable uh, in it. Uh, I looked at a table yesterday at, at Encore. They're the only one that show showed me, and that had five spaces, and that's still not enough to make it a profitable game for them. They're still working on, on a table there to see if they can figure out a way to get the dividers and make it safe for everybody at the table. So, you know, that's still in the works. So we'll, we'll see what, you know, they come up with. I'm willing to work with anybody on, on that. Other jurisdictions have it without any plexiglass at all uh, that offer it, uh, uh, which in my opinion isn't safe for the dealer or, or the players at that point. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions for Bruce? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. So for the next item, I'm going to turn it uh, back over to Bruce and his team. We're going to do a gaming agents operation update. Uh, we've been trying to highlight some of the uh, work and some of the special projects that have been undertaken by different divisions in across the agency. Uh, and Bruce has set up for these senior supervising gaming agents to give you a presentation this morning on some of the things they work on. So yeah. I'll turn it over to Bruce to introduce his team. Yes, this makes uh, Burke and I real proud. Uh, I get to highlight my three senior supervisors and uh, I will turn it over to them. They've worked hard on this. So go ahead, three of you. Andrew, Lewis, and oh. Angela. <laughs> yeah, um, for introductions, why don't you make sure to introduce yourselves? We all know who you are, but in case yeah. somebody yeah. is listening, thanks. Yeah. It's so they all will. Your, it's good to see your faces. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to share my screen um, presentation up. Just want to verify that you can see the slide. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Angel. All right. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners, and welcome to everyone as we present a new day in the life of the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau Gaming Agents Division. My name is Angela Smith, and I am the Senior Supervisor at MGM Springfield. Andrew? Yes. There we go. All right. Thank you. Uh, today, Andrew Lewis and I will present different aspects of the new day in our role as gaming agents. My focus will be a little bit of history, the visual impact of the pandemic, and our agents' commitment to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission's core value, public service and safety. When asked to share thoughts regarding the operational updates affecting the IEB agents, I decided to step back and look at change more broadly. There's been a few things that have curious history and a big impact on the IB this past year. I chose to focus on chairs and plexiglass. But before I discuss the two photos in this slide, I would like to share an interesting fact of casino chair history and the use of plexiglass in casinos prior to 2020. Nevada first legalized gaming in 1931 and in 1976, Atlantic City became another hot spot for gaming. Fast forward to 2020, there are now multiple casinos in multiple jurisdictions throughout the country. And in 2020, all casinos nationwide force faced unprecedented challenges due to the pandemic. So the photo on the left was taken 
<clears throat> prior to 1956. I know this because it was that year Binion's Casino first offered seating for their players as a way to compete with neighboring casinos. I find that amazing that for the first 25 years, slot players traditionally did not sit at the game while playing. The photo on the right raises a lot of red flags and concerns for regulators because of the absence of game protection on that day. Andrew? Okay, thank you. The roulette photo shown on this slide is an example of how plexiglass has been used historically for game protection. Today, with the expanded use of plexiglass throughout casinos, it is not only providing game protection, it is now widely used and used to protect people. Next. These, these two photo sets demonstrate changes in slot configurations from 2015, when the first casino opened in Massachusetts, to the carousel style slot banks we are seeing more of today. When looking at the picture on the left, sorry, no problem. When looking at the picture on the when looking at the picture on the left, you see rows of slot machines <clears throat> placing patrons shoulder to shoulder, whereas the photos on the right show slot banks with designed spacing between the players. Next, I would like. I would like to now share a quick overview of our gaming agent's responsibilities in maximizing safe slot play. <coughs> Excuse me. The three photos at the top of this slide show an example of four inspections our agents complete routinely. The first photo demonstrates our commitment to socially distanced seating. The center photo shows a disabled game between two operational slot machines. The game to the right shows an employee sanitizing the slot machine. The center game has a sticker indicating the game is not available for play. Our gaming agents use a combination of the stickers, CMS, our centralized monitoring system, and the master slot list to verify the correct games are enabled or disabled. The last photo shows our gaming agents demonstrating the height and the width of the plexiglass between two machines. When casinos propose to relocate a slot machine or add a new machine, there are there are step-by-step -step regulatory requirements and our gaming agents are required in each and every step to our gaming our gaming agents are involved in each and every step. To put into perspective the value of gaming agent involvement in inspections. January 2020, MGM had 1,793 slot machines on the casino floor. All were available for play. July 2020, at the time of the reopening, MGM was able to place 869 games up for play following the commission guidelines. March 2021, using plexiglass and floor reconfigurations, MGM now has 1,173 games available for play. Our gaming agents have adopted a wide variety of new inspections and response to the pandemic. We monitor occupancy, mask compliance, alcohol service, sanitizing of gaming equipment. We monitor social distancing throughout the property, including employee areas and promotional events. This list of inspections is just a small sample of the many inspections completed daily by our gaming agents. For me, this is the most important slide in my segment of the presentation. It's a snapshot of what our agents do daily to ensure compliance to reopening standards set by the commission. Our agents complete daily inspections diligently, thoroughly, and without reminder. To summarize, our agents have embraced and realized the importance of their new responsibilities Casinos will continue to evolve with the times, as will IEB. The IEB will always be prepared to uphold the core values of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, putting public ser service and safety first. So in closing my segment of the presentation, please note the photo on the right. This photo was taken 
just prior to reopening. In the photo are the chairs removed from the gaming floor in preparation of social distancing. In this one snapshot, the photo shows the enormity of the reopening process for which our gaming agents provided an integral role. That concludes my portion of the presentation and I will now turn it over to Senior Supervisor Andrew Steffen. Thank you, Angela. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Again, my name is Andrew Steffen. I am the Senior Supervising Agent, uh, working primarily out of our office at Bainbridge Park Casino. Uh, as Angela presented how the casinos have adapted, I'll be discussing how our gaming agents have also adapted throughout the past 12 months. Uh, prior to March 14, 2020, the game agent staff would routinely spend a majority of their time out of the office observing daily casino operations out on the floor or sometimes back at house. Uh, just to highlight a few, agents would, would observe everything from table fills, slide emergency drops, card and dice pickup, staff requirements, all live on the casino floor. The shift agents specifically would spend time in the count room watching the daily counting of poker, table, and slot numbers. Uh, this all came to a halt one year ago when the casinos closed their doors and the agents began working remotely from their homes. Uh, this was a drastic change from what we were all used to. However, the agents quickly adapted and overcame many obstacles to be just as productive. To highlight a few of their remote responsibilities, now, rather than watching the licensee's operational practices, agents began comparing and dissecting the submitted internal controls with our 205 CMR state regulations in what we call a comprehensive line-by-line -line audit. Also, with the introduction of HD Meeting Suite, agents were able to quickly adapt to their remote lives by connecting with fellow agents and supervisors to continue trainings and discussions. On the topic of training, this tool was utilized by all through several remote training sessions such as table games training, uh, the inner workings of slot machines, surveillance techniques, how to handle a patron dispute, and what to do if a patron wishes to suspend their credit. Again, just name a few of the trainings. Uh, agents also attended several webinars, IGT conducted trainings, and LinkedIn learning courses helped guide them through the developmental process. What also greatly helped our staff was the IT upgrades uh, to several useful applications. Uh, I'd like to give a tremendous thank you to our IT department for the substantial improvements that greatly assist our agency as a whole, especially the IEB agents. Over the past year, we received access to LinkedIn Learning, HD Meeting Suite, an updated iTrack server, an updated VPN, a new secure file transfer system, Office 365 with cloud access, and access to CMS uh, Intelligent right on our laptops. I may be missing others, uh, but all these have been a huge benefit to the IB staff. Uh, none bigger though than HD Meeting Suite. This has truly allowed all of our agents to connect in such an odd time. And I'd like to pause just for a moment here, and whether this was at the end of a training session or just to catch up with a colleague, this picture represents agents and supervisors from all three casinos across the state connecting at once. Uh, so moving on, as the agents return to their respective casinos, they continue to provide 24-7 coverage of all three licensees, just as we did prior, with all agents continuing to monitor every aspect of the gaming operation. However, just as we adapted to the remote setting, agents also had to adapt to their new work routine upon returning to the casinos. No longer could we walk out on the casino floor to interact with staff and observe live patron play. We had to revise our investigations and techniques, mostly through surveillance to review and observations. We had to learn how to meet virtually with the licensee and to conduct more over-the-phone conversations with departments. As strange as it was, with this little in-person contact and less time on the casino floor, we all became stronger investigators and leaders. Uh, related to that note, working primarily out of the surveillance room has allowed us to take a new approach on auditing in the casinos through intense examination of their submitted internal controls and their actual practices. Uh, a moment ago, I briefly mentioned our comprehensive line-by-line -line audits and the submitted internal controls. Again, a lot of this was done remotely as it primarily involves comparing two documents. However, once we returned to the casinos, we were able to, take, able to take what we learned, able to take our findings and compare the language in the internal controls against what the licensees are actually practicing. Uh, any discrepancies or observations are first discussed in-house and then with the licensee compliance department to recommend any changes. And to speak on this process in a little more detail, I will now turn it over to fellow senior supervisor, Louis Pizano. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good morning, Chair Commissioners. Uh, just to introduce myself for some who may not know, my name is Louis Lozano, and I'm the Senior Supervising uh, Gaming Agent assigned to Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, to follow up what Andrew presented, IEB Gaming Agents provide 24-7 coverage of the casino floor and establishment, 
and their responsibility is to observe and report. Agents are the eyes and ears for the MGC and report all incidents uh, immediately to supervisors and IB management. Agents monitor all aspects of the casino operations that include table games, slots, accounting, security, surveillance, and alcohol controls. Agents routinely audit, review, and investigate the operation and patron disputes. And if a violation is observed, appropriate action is taken with written documentation that the licensee must acknowledge or potentially receive a monetary fine. I would like to highlight that IEB attempts to build a professional relationship and coordinate with the licensee, not just issue violations and fines. After completing an audit or review, IEB may identify a deficiency in the internal controls of the casino licensee. IEB will then inform the licensee of the deficiency and attempt to implement a change with our recommendation. The purpose of recommending and implementing changes to the internal controls is to strengthen the operational standards that can prevent future issues and ensure compliance. An example of identifying a deficiency and implementing an appropriate change uh, is the verification of taxable jackpot amounts for slot machines. Initially, Encore only verified jackpots over a certain amount to ensure taxable transactions were in compliance. After extensive periodic reviews, uh, IEB agents determined a common occurrence. Some patrons who activated taxable jackpots would allow another patron to redeem the jackpot and complete tax reporting documentation. A possible reason for this activity was to avoid intercepting money uh, from the Department of Revenue or the licensee for being a voluntary self-excluded state exclusion or underage uh, slash minor. So after identifying this specific deficiency, IEB recommended a change uh, that the licensee agreed to significantly lower the threshold of inspected slot jackpot amounts. The licensee also agreed to update their internal controls that would require all internal departments to coordinate and resolve incorrect tax reporting documentation after a taxable jackpot switch was identified by either an IEB agent or the licensee. The implementation of the submission change creates a stronger checks and balances and nearly eliminates the opportunity for a patron to successfully complete a jackpot switch. The uh, current chart that you see in front of you demonstrates the importance of verifying taxable slot jackpots. This chart displays the 2020 totals for each licensee department of revenue intercepts and the licensee confiscations for voluntary self-exclusions and underages. Uh, the Department of Revenue intercept jackpots for patrons that owe pass due child support and back taxes. The licensee will attempt to confiscate money, convert into gaming chip <laughs> vouchers, and identify the amount lost by a voluntary self-exclusion and underage. After the confiscation, the licensee will issue a receipt to the individual and the licensee will deposit the converted gaming currency into the gaming revenue fund. As you can see, approximately $2.3 million was intercepted by the Department of Revenue. Approximately 143,000 was confiscated for voluntary self-exclusions and approximately 5,000 was confiscated for underages at all three casinos. An additional area to note in respect to the licensee implementing a change recommended by the IEB would be the routine inspection itself of the game. Gaming Lab International is a company contracted by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission to provide an independent testing of all electronic gaming products. As seen in this picture, IEB agents regularly inspect table game shufflers and slot machines at each licensee to ensure, uh, ensure GLI software certifications are in compliance. Uh, as an additional measure, uh, IEB recommended the licensee also inspect shuffler software as this could easily be completed during preventative maintenance. So as a combination of the licensee certifying they comply with GLI standards and agents inspecting gaming equipment in theory will lead to less issues and create a greater public confidence to ensure fair gaming. So as presented, the pandemic has changed the industry. Uh, it's changed the way gaming agents operate. The licensees and gaming agents have adapted to the change, but what stays the same is the role of the IB. The IB is a fair but firm regulator. Uh, we coordinate with the licensee to implement changes and improve standards. That stays the same. Angela, Andrew, and I would like to thank you for allowing us to
provide this operational update. And if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer. Excellent. Thank you so much. I can see why Bruce and Burke are so proud of this team, commissioners. They, they are just incredible and they do, they do such a great job on site at the casino. Karen, if, um, Andrew, if you could take down the slide, uh, um, then we'll be able to see everyone and we can have questions. That was excellent. Um, excellent. And we have plenty of time. Um, our next uh, um, item will be is coming uh, will be scheduled for 11. So this is an opportunity for us to ask Angela and Andrew and Liz questions and also for them to brag even further about their teams. Uh, Andrew, could you remind everybody that just one second, sorry, Gail, um, the number of, of um, gaming agents under all three of you to get collective. Between all three of us, we have 11 supervisors and 16 gaming agents. Does that sound right? 27. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Gail, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't have questions, but of course, I'm so impressed with this presentation. Really gave me an insight into what you're doing differently, how effectively you're able to do it differently, um, and 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 your commitment to public service and safety. Um, and you led with that, and that is a really important piece. So you led with the public safety and the um, the public service and the in the uh, safety, and then you ended with the fair but firm regulator. So all of the information was informative. Um, I'm smiling the whole time you're presenting because I'm really proud of the work you're doing and how you were able to transition and actually state that you think it's helped you become better investigators. That's really, really impressive. So congrats to all of you because you are leaders and you are setting the tone for all your agents and um, just really, really impressive um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Zinica or Commissioner O'Brien, maybe I don't know who was leaning in first. Commissioner Zinica. Uh, well, thank you. Um, just uh, similar um, uh, similar feelings. Um, thanks for the for the overview. I think uh, you do a lot of great work uh, before and after uh, the pandemic. Um, it's clear that uh, in my mind, there's a key word that emerges in what you've done, not just in the presentation, and that's uh, <laughs> flexibility in an industry that is in a role that you have to be very strict about procedures, this pandemic uh, presented a unique challenge, in my opinion, as to how to adapt. Um, you know, we, we, we did the initial work in, in, in concept uh, relative to setting guidelines, but I know that there's a lot that goes in the implementation, the details, and the need to work with the operator, as you, as you say, um, towards managing a public that is uh, a bit of a wild card, if you will, when it comes to, um, you know, to setting up guidelines and, and, and asking them to follow. So, um, so again, congratulations on, on that. And, 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 um, and it's great that you are uh, flexible. Um, and um, I will finish with a question. Uh, and that is um, your impression of the public uh, compliance with this their own flexibility and adaptability, because that is something that, at least in my mind, is always um, something that you guys have to deal with. Um, that is not necessarily a regulation of, of, of the licensee. I, I, you can I share. Can, I can, go ahead, I can I'll go ahead Angela. Uh, with, the, with the transition from rows and rows of slot machines to the more carousel style slot machines. We've received a lot of feedback from patrons that they really like that setup. The machines, of course, are flashier and bigger and fancier, but I think just the general, you know, moving away from the shoulder to shoulder contact with other slot players uh, provides a different experience for the players. And, and it's been, we've gotten positive feedback from that. Andrew and Lewis, do you want to chime in on that? different facilities yeah um, you know encore I think the numbers speak for themselves at encore uh, they have less slot machines um, but the numbers are very similar to uh, how they previously were prior to closure 
with the plexiglass. So less slot machines and almost the same amount of money. Um, and I think that that just speaks for itself. I think people almost like that um, that space on, on playing with the slot machine. Um, so I, I can see potentially uh, when everything is all said and done, I can potentially see maybe plexiglass staying for a very long time, specifically on slot machines. Yeah, maybe not only flexi, but also the social distancing too. Um, slot machines farther apart, carousels, I believe that's the way the casinos were headed. Anyways, and this may have just jump-started the carousels instead of the long rows. Um, all three licensees have done a tremendous job utilizing every space on the casino floor. I know up at Encore, uh, they changed the poker room into a new slot floor. Um, at PPC, they put slot machines where self-service beverage stations used to be. So every licensee has utilized every square footage of their casino. That's interesting, uh, and uh, and I can I can probably agree with that. I'm I'm probably gonna be using a lot more hand sanitizer even after the pandemic. <laughs> so there's likely gonna be some behavioral changes. Um, you know, okay. let me stick around. Yeah, Andrew, when when I visited PPC for the renewal um, the license, you pointed out the efficiencies that were achieved, um, and so that you know it, it shows that our um, our team here really does, um, they, they are committed to their core values, as, as Commissioner Cameron pointed out. They're driven by them, and that's their leadership um, to, to lead by their core values. But they're, as they say, they're fair um, and firm regulators, and the fairness comes in that, with that partnership. You all have the respect of the, the properties, and you work in partnership, your teams do. And so you notice how they're creating creating efficiencies for their business. And that's really important. Uh, they, they feel that support. Uh, Commissioner um, O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I agree with um, what Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner Zuniga said in terms of um, liking the presentation. It's really impressive to see and remember how quickly this all got implemented and seamlessly um, in large measure because of the professionalism of the gaming agents and the cooperation of the licensees. Um, I, I do want to take this opportunity also to once again say thank you to the gaming agents, the supervisors, and to you three for going in to the casinos every day to make this happen. I have been able to continue my job for the last year in the safety of my home. I just think it bears repeating that, you know, with all the safety measures in place, it's still a different thing to ask people to go in and, and do their job not from their home. And I just want to say thank you to the almost 30 of you in this capacity that have been doing that every day. Um, and then I have a random question as the history major in me, which is why did they shift to putting chairs in, you know, back at that point? Was it to get people to stay longer or was there some other weird cultural reason they decided to do it? I'm, I'm so happy you asked that question. Um, <laughs> so back in the day, prior to 1956, when Binion's first offered chairs, slot machines were looked at as a, a side thing for the ladies to play while their husbands did real gaming on the table games. So wow. one, of the, one of the things that Binion's noticed is that often if, if, if a patron needed to step away from the game, they would find a chair and lean it up against the slot machine and you know go have lunch or do whatever they needed to do. And that would reserve their slot machine until they came back. So that sparked the idea to Binion's as they were, you know, more in competition as more casinos were opening. But maybe if they just put the chairs at the slot machines, it would just make everything easier for everyone. And to, interestingly, today, walking through the casinos, you will still see chairs leaning against slot machines. And it's, it's just a tradition that's been carried on. Saving their, saving their lucky. <laughs> Lucky machine, right? Yeah. Right. Interesting. Right. Wow. Um, and, and it's interesting now because our health metrics push us to stand. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I, I thought that was interesting. The, um, the business model encourages sitting and the health metric uh, encourages us to stand. So um, Maybe it'll evolve into some choices eventually, Angela, so that folks can stand for a long time because of the health metric. But um, thank you. Uh, 
Commissioner I have a follow-up follow to Angela's um, answer, which I find fascinating. Just a minute. Uh, do yeah. you know, um, I mean, I, in my mind, there's still a bit of a stereotype, I want to be careful, about uh, these days, about uh, women still preferring uh, slot machines generally, um, or the slot player being mostly a majority women and uh, men on, um, on, on tables. Is that still the case, would you say, or is that an antiquated um, aspect? My opinion, I think, is a generational thing. I think older folks tend to stay with what they're comfortable with. And, uh, you know, the younger generation, you know, they'll, 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 they'll play anything if they're interested in it. So it's, it's evolving. I would, agree. I would agree with Angela. I, I go on the floor uh, and it's, it's a mix. You don't see, you don't see uh, just females playing slot machines. It's just as much, many males as women. Thank you. You're I, I will add something historical. I have seen, uh, instead of chairs, a uh, try at a treadmill and a bicycle seat. <laughs> In front of a slot machine, and they have not been very successful. I will add that. <laughs> but to my point, thank you, Bruce. That's really funny. So the history, we've been really lucky recently. We've been getting um, a lot of good history on uh, the gaming industry. And thank you, Karen, uh, for uh, your leadership on that through the team in our different uh, our town halls. So this is, I love that you led with the historic images. I also have to say, um, before we close on questions, the, the photo of all the chairs, um, it kind of brought a little, you know, it, it brought me back um, to our decision making and, and the impact um, that we knew at the time would have on, on our three licensees. And as you point out, the agility that was needed for uh, all of you to do your jobs in partnership with them. Um, it was a a, a big ask uh, to reopen so safely. I know that we use the term a sustainable reopening. And, you know, again, uh, it's, it has turned out to be just that. Uh, we haven't had to reverse course. We've been able to move forward um, on uh, the uh, options for gaming. And it's because of all the work that you all did to uh, meet the uh, restrictions and guidelines that we had to put in place for the safety of the employees, for the safety of you, and of course the safety of the patrons. So the, that picture really captured the enormity and Angela, that, I know that's exactly why you put it in there. Um, it's a reminder of all the work and also the enormity of the consequences had, any, had you not done the job with the excellence that you pursued. So thank you. Um, wonderful. Uh, Bruce, can that, those slides be shared with us? Yeah, they're, they, they will share it to you, you know, send it out to you today. Thank yeah, you. I think Andrew that, has the main one. <laughs> I was thinking that would be great for the new commissioner that comes on as a, as a part of the briefing packet, you know. Yeah. Let's put that in the onboarding package, absolutely. Um, and, and they'll act, whoever it is will, will, um, be able to meet with, um, Lewis and, and Andrew and Angela too, of course, and uh, give up a first firsthand uh, briefing. But thank you, and of course to to Bruce for your leadership. Um, this was really special. And be, before we we close on this, any other questions? This is a great opportunity. Okay. Again, I think Commissioner O'Brien said it. You know. Perfectly, we we know that it was a much different ask of you. We weren't surprised by how you stepped up. So thank you again. Um, I never doubted him. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right, Bruce. Isn't that the truth? Yes. So I think then we'll move on then to if there's no other um, questions, we'll move on to item uh, C. Yes. So, um, Cameron. Yes. So, uh, I spoke to Commissioner Cameron briefly this morning. She has uh, more information than I do on the IAGR update. Uh, she had some conversations this week, so she has the latest. So, I'm going to turn it over to her to just update uh, the team on the IAGR conference, which is scheduled for this fall. 
So good morning, everyone. And um, I'll, I'll start by saying it's going to be a joint conference, right? And this is the conference that we were supposed to be the host agency for last year in September 2020. And of course, because of the pandemic, it was canceled and uh, pushed to this year. And even this year was um, somewhat tenuous, right? Because things aren't back to normal yet. But I, I believe both organizations, and when I say that, we're talking about IAGR and IMGL, and that's the, um, for those of you who don't know, the International Association of Gaming Regulators, as well as the International Masters of Gaming Law. So it's a little bit unusual to have a joint conference. It's been done before, but not in many years. The last one, I believe, was in, was in uh, Peru, and uh, Lima, Peru. And, um, but I think there was such a big interest in regulators, again, very international, regulators from around the world. Um, and there was a real interest in coming to Boston. Um, it's a city that's in demand for conferences and the work that we're doing, frankly, and new casinos, uh, integrated resort casinos, lots of interest. In so we will be the host agency for both organizations, and that is in September, the week of the 12th through the 17th. And our, you know, our role will be to host, to make sure um, everything goes well, whether that be IT concerns, the space, um, just, just all around kind of be part of this uh, as the host agency. One of the things I look forward to is hosting the, um, the golf tournament, which is held <laughs> by the IAGRA crowd on the Sunday. The conference typically starts Monday morning, and those who are uh, golfers, um, come in on that Sunday to play in this a little tournament and a, and a winner from um, different countries uh, around the world. So it's, it's something that I'll uh, make sure. And please, anyone that's a golfer, you can take part in this. So um, the name of the IAGRA portion, which is the beginning of the week, is um, disrupting the regulator. And that is really sparking innovation in the regulatory practice. So just kind of a catchy name. Um, and um, I think the decision has been made to host this this year, although we do expect greatly reduced numbers. Um, but luckily, the teams were able to successfully um, negotiate, renegotiate with the Marriott Copley because that, that was a, a bid that went out and they won the bid to host this conference, obviously more than a year ago now. And, um, but they were uh, very good uh, about reducing dramatically. So, you know, food and beverage commitments are greatly reduced, as well as the original block of rooms that, you know, you need in order to host. So right now, they're guessing. There was a survey that went out. Um, IAGR did a survey to all of their um, members around the world, and there's a lot of maybes. So it's really hard to know what those numbers will be. There was some likely, some maybes. And um, so it's really hard. But just to I guess, um, Iagra's thinking or, uh, maybe maybe a quarter of what they usually get. And if that's somewhere between 300 and 400, um, you, know, you know, Iagra has two issues, right? One is travel is still not... Um, um, even recommended throughout the world. So one of them is the ability to travel and two are the travel restrictions or rather the travel budgets, right? Because all of the regulators are funded by um, the industry and thus uh, that's, that's a little difficult. Um, IMGL, uh, the, uh, the advisors in, in the law, the legal teams, may not have those same budgetary issues. So they're actually uh, anticipating about 100 um, attendees, which is far fewer as well. But, um, but like I say, those negotiations have happened. So right now, everybody's going to get together and look at the smaller spaces in Boston. What will that look like? Uh, the joint day for both organizations is Wednesday. It's, we're putting together that. That's when maybe we'll have a dignitary at the beginning, and then maybe someone speak to the joint group on Wednesday. Um, our chair has been very good about reaching out to the governor's office. Hopefully, we'll have the governor on board at one time here. So, um, so that's what we know. Um, some of the possible topics, uh, I've been involved with both organizations, so I jump on the, the conference calls for both. 
Um, IMGL is talking about uh, Indian gaming. Uh, these are all the possible, nothing's been finalized yet. What does that mean with a change of administration? Esports and wagering, um, you know, alternate events for regulators, uh, integrity of those sports. Sports betting is, is going to be there. New jurisdictions, new sports, expansions. What does that mean? That may be of great interest to us. They talked about college teams, private operations, the leagues, um, you know, sports integrity. So all of those may be of great value to us if in fact, um, it becomes legal here in the Commonwealth. Um, another topic may be the new regulator for Ireland because of in the shadow of Brexit. I personally love the international presentations because it really reminds us that we are not in this alone, that we can learn from our partners from around the world and they can learn from us. So um, those are just a quick update of where we are right now. I know um, we're fortunate to have Executive Director Wells serve on the IAGRA board as a trustee. And so she hears at her board meetings about some of these things. But unless you, Karen, do you have something to add that I may have uh, missed here? Nope, that's, that's very comprehensive and that's consistent with what I've been hearing at the board meetings. You know, it's, um, you know, we're really looking forward to doing something. I think people are looking for an event. You know, it's been a long haul, so I'm hoping that uh, we'll get a good turnout. It's just challenging to predict right now. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a tricky time. So we'll uh, go forward and we're trying to be as flexible as possible so that we can uh, do the best job we can. Questions for Commissioner Cameron and Executive Director Wells. I see Commissioner Zinnega, you're leaning in. Yeah, thanks. Um, please uh, remind us if you, if you have this at your fingertips, uh, whether the request for presenters uh, has been extended or settled or is a, a date in the future. I can think of a couple of um, our own people who might want to submit a, a proposal for a presentation uh, on some of the work that we've done here. Several uh, of our be, people, several of our accepted. people did put in, uh, did offer to present. And I, I think that those final decisions haven't been made yet. Okay. Right. Um, but I, I do know that um, our folks stepped up in a big way and, and, and uh, offered to present. It's just unknown. Director Wells, is that so that, that, that those final decisions haven't been made yet? That's, that's correct. So. Uh, you know, we'll, uh, the, the team that's coordinating this will be looking at it going forward. Thank you. Well, I want to thank um, Commissioner Cameron for your leadership on this. It's been an evolving project. Um, I know that in 2019 you were working hard on it um, and everything obviously shifted and now you've got the um, good assistance of uh, Karen, uh, who serves not only as a trustee, but treasurer. Uh, so this is all um, uh, fluid. We understand that. All I know is that when this happens, we want, to, we want to have a great spotlight on our work and a great spotlight on the Commonwealth and, and Boston. And I'm sure that will be accomplished, you know, whatever scale it needs to be. So uh, Agreed. Thank we look you. forward to that. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a it's an exciting opportunity um, as things begin to open up. So we'll stay tuned for continuing updates. Great. Um, I know that we have um, Professor Bruce is ready to go. I want to give um, our commissioners a chance for a, a four minute break. We do have um, guests who are who plan to for a start at eleven. I promised an eleven start. So uh, if you wanna take a, a four minute break, come right promptly back to 11, that will be great. And then we'll look forward to um, Director Vander Linden's um, introduction. Thanks so much. Um, so uh, we're, we're very pleased to have uh, ahead two public safety reports. There's a lot of benefit in having some synergy between the two reports presented. So thank you um, commissioners um, O'Brien and Cameron for um, your leadership on this, and of course, Director Vander Linden. Um, I understand that today, uh, Senator Adam uh, Gomez intends to um, attend, and members of his staff, uh, Danielle Allard, Chief of Staff and General Counsel, and Anthony Moore, uh, 
district director. We also understand um, Representative Joseph McGonigal will be here to, uh, to both the Senator and Representative. Thank you uh, for attending and for your interest. Um, from Mayor Sarno's office, we welcome City Solicitor um, Ed Pakula and of course City Development Officer Tim Sheehan. We understand that they will be um, attending uh, today and thank you. Um, and then from Mayor uh, De Maria's office, uh, Chief of Staff Aaron Devaney. So thank you. We have members of the public um, safety um, and law enforcement community today attending. I have in my notes, but I know I see other folks. Um, Police Commissioner Cheryl Krupp, um, Rude from the city of Springfield, and perhaps that's who I can, I can, I can, there, there we, we have her. You're a little bit further away, but we see you and thank you for attending. Now, do you wish to um, introduce your colleague who's sitting with you? Yeah, my executive aide is Captain Jeffrey Martucci is with us today. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, we also have um, uh, attending uh, Chief of Police, uh, Stephen Massey, I believe. Um, and I see Chief Dunn. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, thank you. Yeah, Chief Ed Dunn from the Thalma Police Department. I'm also president of the Mass Chiefs Police Association. Thank you so much for attending. We, we appreciate it. And this is an opportunity for you to hear from two areas. So this is great. Is there anyone I could have missed? Well, Mark and Jill, um, thank you. Oh, I know yes. one other person. Yes. Um, I don't see her, but um, perhaps she's joining by phone. But the chair of GPAC, um, gubernatorial appointee Meg Amnazer Cohen, is, plans to attend. So thank you again. We're happy to have her representation for the uh, Gaming um, Policy Advisory Commission. So thank you. Anyone else, Mark? I'm sorry. No, actually, that's who I was going to mention. Yeah, we, we both have the same um, idea. Thank you. All right, then we should get started. Uh, Director Vandalin. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, I am joined today by uh, Christopher Bruce, who I see in the screen uh, below me. Um, before we get started, just a brief introduction. So uh, Section 71 of tra Chapter 23K directs the Commission to carry out an annual research agenda. Broadly, the purpose of this agenda is in furtherance of understanding the social and economic effects of expanded gaming in the Commonwealth. Included in this section is a specific requirement to assess the relationship between gambling and levels of crime. It makes sense because crime would straddle both the social and economic impacts. Concerns about this connection are not new and date back decades, if not further. And it certainly has a connection back in the early days of Las Vegas in the 1930s. Um, we were speaking earlier about some of the history of gambling. Uh, there was a book that chronicles um, this relationship as well as just the overall history of, of gambling. Um, it's called Roll, Roll the Bones, and it was written by uh, David Schwartz, um, a, a fantastic and easy read. What, what, what isn't well understood is the link between crime and casinos today in, in this era. Academic literature is split with as many studies showing that there is an increase of crime due to gambling as those that show absolutely no impact between uh, levels of crime and gambling. We're really fortunate. Today we have two reports that tip, uh, chip away at that question and add to that body of evidence. The first is an analysis uh, of changes in police data following 18 months of activity at MGM, plus an additional three months looking at COVID-related closures. The second is an analysis of the influence of Encore Boston Harbor on its um, coast and surrounding communities, covering the first eight months of operations three months of closure, and then three months following re reopening. These reports build upon 10 other public safety reports that have been done since 2015, including baseline studies in each of the host and surrounding communities uh, where we currently have casinos. All of this body of research has been led by Christopher Bruce. We've been fortunate to, to have Christopher Bruce as a consultant to the commission and principal investigators on each one of these reports. 
Christopher is a professor of criminal justice at Hassan University in Bangor, Maine. Um, he also has been a, a crime analyst uh, with the Cambridge Police Departments and Danvers Police Departments. He served as the president of the Massachusetts Association of Crime Analysts, as well as president of the International Association of Crime Analysts. He has extensive experience and um, probably way too broad to dive into, but he's taught as well as consulted um, across, the, across the country. Um, and he joined us actually in 2014 to kick this study off. So um, I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Bruce now to, to kick off the presentation. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, this is a, a very well attended uh, version of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to share my screen while I'm talking. I shouldn't do that. I, one thing at a time. Okay, there we go. Um, I did, didn't expect so much uh, attendance here, and I, I kind of uh, feel bad for any people who are hearing this for the first time uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the data that I'm covering here, unfortunately, is quite a bit old. I, um, I started the Springfield Report in the summertime, uh, and um, it, I just, for various reasons, uh, I, they were delayed. So we're really covering uh, fairly old findings here, uh, except for the, the COVID part. Um, second of all, I just want to make clear for anybody who uh, hasn't seen me present on this material before, that it's a little bit too early to answer sort of macro level questions on whether casinos cause or uh, influence or increase crime in this, the surrounding areas. Uh, you know, to draw uh, conclusions like that, uh, we would want multiple years of data, especially from comparison areas, which tend to lag a bit behind the, uh, the casino uh, communities themselves uh, in terms of data availability. Uh, and therefore, this, these reports and most of the, the interim reports, the analyses that I do, are just mechanisms to try to identify what did increase in the immediate area after the introduction of the casinos uh, so that law enforcement agencies can respond effectively to those increases and look for any evidence that maybe there was a casino cause uh, to some of those patterns. But it's it's very rare that we actually have the the smoking gun, the, the, the concrete link uh, between the casino and a, a crime pattern. So as we're gonna see in some of the things that I demonstrate today, uh, there are some patterns that, that there are some crimes that increased. There are some patterns that became evident uh, after the casino opened. Some of them have a logical uh, connection to gambling. Some of them have a spatial connection to the casino. But very rarely do we have something like a known offender who we can say for sure was in the area because of the the casino. If that makes sense. Uh, so today, um, as Mark said, we're going to uh, take a look at the final findings, pre-COVID findings for MGM and Encore. So I presented on Encore already uh, for a six-month period after they opened. Covering through the end of 2019, and this basically just tacks on two additional months to it to cover th the period through the point at which the, um, the casinos closed for a few months. Uh, I have some base, some statistics on the closure period and then some statistics on what happened uh, during the limited reopening. But as we're going to talk about, COVID really throws a, a major wrench into this entire project. And so we'll have to talk a little bit about the, uh, the overall future of the project. But let's begin with the Springfield area where these 11 communities have all participated since the beginning in the, the collection of data. And uh, this is, an, it, it's, it's been a great experience because although this has, this region has the most agencies participating of any of the three regions, they've also been the most consistent in providing uh, the necessary data in a timely manner. And I really appreciate all the agencies that are on the call today who are a part of, of this region. The general trends that I want to talk about that we saw in the 18 months after MGM opened uh, in this region are, are as follows. First of all, shoplifting uh, showed increases in several stores in Chicopee and Holyoke in particular. And um, 
whenever you see the numbers in brackets like that, the, the number in brackets is the number, uh, so eight, there were 874 incidents in the 18th month period versus a predicted window of 746 to 814. The predicted window being a mathematical uh, conclusion that based on past data. So what, what was the trend looking like before MGM opened and therefore what would be a normal volume if MGM had not opened uh, in this um, area during that period? Uh, if the number that actually happened is well outside of that window, it could be a sign of an MGM influence. It could be a sign of a number of other things that could be happening in, in these communities. This is what uh, I try to then investigate further. Now, in this particular case, the agencies largely reported to us that they believe that uh, these shoplifting increases, uh, which are he particularly heavy at home improvement warehouses, are caused by out-of-state organized uh, shoplifters who don't have any connection to MGM or using MGM that they know about. Shoplifting, I should point out, is a notoriously difficult crime to measure. It's heavily um, influenced by store reporting practices. We only really know about shoplifting incidents when we catch somebody, so the statistics don't reflect the cases that when people aren't caught, basically. Uh, the quality of the security department, security staffing, et cetera, uh, tends to drive the numbers up and down from year to year anyway. So uh, it, that one, um, it's worth noting, it's worth continuing to monitor, but uh, I don't think we found any kind of MGM connection there. Drunk driving uh, arrests increased significantly in the region. And there's evidence uh, from the agencies reporting that that's largely because they were doing more enforcement uh, for drunk driving. So we had a predicted window of 133 to 254, and there were 312 uh, arrests during this period. Again, this isn't necessarily a reflection of actual drunk driving because uh, it's heavily dependent on how much the agencies are out there looking for drunk drivers and doing enforcement. But I have a whole drunk driving section later on where we look at additional evidence for that crime specifically. Liquor laws also increased, uh, liquor law violations, uh, but they seem to be related to the same issue where the, the agencies are making more traffic stops and therefore finding more people with open containers uh, in the, uh, during those stops. Fraud and identity theft are the, the two crimes that are particularly high throughout the area, uh, very consistently across multiple agencies. And these are, the, these are types of crimes that have a sort of a logical relation to a cash business and it would make sense uh, for them to go up maybe if uh, in a casino area, except the evidence seems to be that they're increasing all over Massachusetts. Uh, and so I don't have uh, comparative data. It's only just becoming available now uh, for, for 2019 and 2020. Uh, so in a couple of months, we should have more data from the entire state and be able to tell how much those crimes increased statewide versus the casino areas. But right now, I think it's just a statewide increase in, in those particular crimes. Uh, several communities have had repeat patterns of purse snatching, and it, we don't know who the offender is uh, for, for most of them. And so it's, it's impossible to say whether or not uh, that person might have been in the area for casino purposes, uh, but uh, it, it's definitely something interesting. These are agencies that have not in the past had a lot of patterns of this particular crime, and then we're going to see several of them on the maps that I'll, I'll show in just a minute. Um, immediately adjacent to the casino, there have been a couple of businesses to see increases in crime, which we'll take a closer look at in just a second. Traffic uh, complaints on state roads have gone up. Traffic complaints can be anything from people calling in, in a municipal agency. It could include parking complaints on highways. Obviously, that doesn't uh, really happen, but it, they could be complaints of erratic drivers, potentially drunk drivers, somebody speeding. It, they're people calling to complain about other drivers, basically, and those have increased a lot on the highways directly around MGM. There were a few things that I reported after a year uh, that didn't continue into the, f the subsequent six month period. Traffic collisions were one of them. They had increased mildly in the surrounding area, right around the casino 
and on some of the feeder roads going in uh, to the bridges crossing the river uh, to the casino from West Springfield and Agawam. And those didn't continue into the, the, the six month period after the first year. That was a, a, a winter, a fall winter period. And it was very mild, it was a very mild winter. So the total number of traffic collisions went uh, down uh, statewide really because of the weather conditions. It's hard to really control for that. What this really sort of demonstrates, and we, we, see, we saw mild increases in traffic collisions around Plainville too. Uh, and it makes sense that you'd see an increase in traffic collisions with extra traffic coming to the areas. But what I think this shows is that the extra collisions have been, the increase has been small enough that other factors easily wipe them out basically and, and make them undetectable. And, and we'll definitely see that with, uh, with COVID. Uh, we saw an increase in domestic violence uh, for the first year, but that didn't continue into the next six months. Uh, West Springfield had had some problems with lots of panhandling, suspicious activity, disorderly conduct near the uh, bridge uh, leading over to uh, the two bridges leading to to Springfield uh, at some shopping centers immediately adjacent to those bridges. That didn't continue into the the next six months. And Springfield, Long Meadow, and East Long Meadow had seen a problem with thefts from uh, houses and thefts from cars in residential driveways. Uh, and when I say thefts from houses, I'm not talking about burglaries, that's a separate crime. I'm talking about just, I actually don't know for sure because the data I get doesn't really give me the situational variables, but I'm, I'm guessing just from what I do have that it's largely um, thefts from yards, uh, maybe open garages, you know, things left in the, the curtilage around the house and, uh, and also from cars in the driveways. Uh, there were patterns of those throughout uh, Springfield and East Longmeadow and Longmeadow in the first year. The pat there was still some of that, but they weren't higher than normal uh, for the six months after the first year. So uh, some examples here. Sorry, my slides are refusing to advance. What is happening? My apologies for a second. We see the next slide. Oh, no, same slide. <laughs> I can't get the, there we go. There you go. Clicking the next arrow and it's not advancing. Um, so uh, those purse snatching patterns I talked about, uh, during the first uh, six months after MGM opened, we saw uh, five of them along this uh, Riverdale Street here in, in West Springfield. And they weren't all, all the same scenario, uh, but it's still an, an inter just an, a weird concentration for an agency that didn't typically report any of them. Uh, and then Springfield had this, this pattern, uh, in, during, geographic pattern during the first year after MGM opened. You can see MGM here and then several around it and in, in the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, that kind of went away after September 2019. Holyoke had a, a pattern downtown during the, the same uh, post year, year post uh, casino opening. Uh, and then it sort of changed and here's, here's Holyoke uh, in the, the six months after this pattern. So it spread out a little bit towards this end of the downtown area. But it's, so these repeated patterns just of, of purse snatching just keep uh, keep popping up. And these are not agencies that have typically reported a lot of that in, in the past. Again, we don't really have suspects in a lot of these cases. We don't have offenders in a lot of these cases. Uh, so th there's no direct connection to be tied, uh, but it, it's something to definitely to keep investigating. And, and monitoring. Now, as I, in addition to the, the macro statistics that I, I worked with for uh, each agency, which you can see in the, in the report, I didn't, I didn't want to cover all of that uh, during this presentation, so I'll leave you to read the report for just to see what the actual numbers are. I'm, I'm just sort of covering the highlights here. But in addition to the each agency, I also broke down uh, Springfield uh, in, by geography. Uh, and we took a look at the statistics right in the the MGM block here, uh, and then in the, the metro center uh, surrounding MGM, and then in the wider neighborhood uh, surrounding that. So the MGM block has, you know, the casino and, and the 
adjacent businesses. The Metro Center is mostly commercial. Uh, and then the, this area has a lot of residential neighborhoods as well, the wider uh, area. And throughout all three areas, crime mostly just held steady. There were some, you know, some increases, some decreases, but that would have been true uh, no matter what. Any, any neighborhood's always going to show a few crimes up, a few crimes down for any period that you look at. But there wasn't very much that I thought was tied uh, to MGM. And, and that might sound, you know, just sort of like a neutral news, basically, that crime held steady in the area. But we have to keep in mind that there's been about, you know, a few million extra people uh, coming through that area during this period. Uh, so by a rate alone, that should have increased crime, but it really didn't. And, uh, and that really, I think, it um, provides evidence of sort of a, a, a um, hypothesis that a lot of criminologists would have had that, that I had about the area, which is that any additional crime that would have been caused by just all of the extra people are kind of neutralized by the fact that all those extra people are serving as natural guardians for each other in an area that um, that has historically had a, a sort of a higher than average crime rate. So basically, you know, streets that might normally have been sem semi-deserted and would have been good places for robberies and, and other types of crime uh, have now lots of people, you know, walking around on them, or did at least, uh, you know, in the in the pre-COVID uh, timeframes. And those people serve as sort of natural protectors uh, for each other. So basically, they've canceled each other out, and crime has remained uh, fairly steady in this area. The, the exceptions are just in a couple of businesses. Uh, and one is the CVS that opened on Main Street, uh, and, and it only increased in the sense that it didn't exist before. So the, the CVS, uh, I had it in the report. I don't, I forgot to take a note about exactly what day it opened, but I think it was somewhere in, in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and that location has been the site of 15 incidents of shoplifting, two robberies, and a purse snatching uh, since it opened. No, I don't know for sure. But my guess is the opening of that uh, CVS, you know, is tied economically, at least, uh, to the extra traffic occasioned by the casino. So in an indirect way, we can say that that's sort of a cause uh, of the, uh, the extra activity there. It's happening. Uh, the CVS isn't open 24 hours. It's only open till 10 p.m. And incidents are really happening sort of all throughout the day. I don't know that, I don't think that they're necessarily involving casino patrons or anything. Uh, they could be, be local residents being involved there. But again, the business itself didn't exist before the casino opened. The other business is this Pride gas station across the uh, Columbus Street. And that's open 24 hours. It's the only gas station in the in the immediate area, I believe, that's open uh, 24 hours, and they've had a, a lot of activity about four to five, three to four times their normal volume of activity uh, since MGM opened. Uh, about half of it uh, in the hours between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m., and those include a couple simple assaults, an aggravated assault, four shopliftings, three thefts, vandalism, disorderly conduct. Uh, a fair number of the people involved being from outside the immediate Springfield area, uh, suggesting they're coming, you know, from a distance for some reason. Uh, there's a logical connection to the casino, but I don't know for sure that they were uh, using the casino. So th those two businesses in the immediate block have seen those increases. As I said, state police uh, complaints of traffic issues have uh, increased on the local highways. You can see on this chart, it's mostly concentrated on 91 and 90. Other things can affect that too. Uh, it seems to me that those the numbers are too high to be explained uh, by the casino solely, uh, by the extra traffic caused by the casino solely. So there are probably other issues happening on, on those roads at the same time. But when it comes to drunk driving, uh, Yes, first of all, many communities are seeing uh, increases in arrests. When we look at, so it's really tough to, to get a, a bead on crashes caused by, by drunk driving. Uh, 
uh, which is really the metric you want to use if you want to know if drunk, is, if drunk driving itself has increased versus just police enforcement of drunk driving. We want to look at crashes with an alcohol cause. Uh, the problem is we don't track that very well in, in Massachusetts. And the although the records management system used by all of these agencies has a field for that, and I did offer those statistics in the report, I don't think the field is being used uh, as often as there are, in fact, uh, alcohol causes of many of the collisions. So one way that I've looked at the data is to just basically look at which incidents started off as a collision and included later on a charge for drunk driving. And that kind of controls for police agency ex enforcement because if if it started as a crash, it means they didn't they weren't out there um, you know doing extra enforcement that, that caused the the increase. Uh, it's actual crashes that are increasing related to alcohol. And there's those are slightly high, a little bit above average for the area, not not as significantly as they are in the Everett area, which we'll talk about. Um, also, MGM appears uh, seven times amid court adjudications uh, where they've asked the convicted drunk driver, where were you last drinking uh, during a one year period after uh, after MGM opened. So it's not a lot, you know, once every couple of months. Of course, many of the, the arrests during that period haven't been adjudicated yet. So we'll have better data on that particular thing as, as we continue going forward. What I want to do next is, uh, we'll talk more about that in the, in the upcoming uh, section, but what I want to do next is look at those last drink locations during ar arrests themselves. So what did they report to the police uh, when they were arrested? The overall conclusion I would draw from this is that it, the casino has probably caused a slight uh, increase in, in drunk driving. I think probably certainly uh, comparable to other facilities that serve alcohol in in the actual volume of of drivers, and uh, I don't I don't want to seem like I'm you know suggesting that there's a particular problem there. Any place that you serve alcohol, you're going to have a number of people who leave when they shouldn't be, be driving, and it's really tough to control for them all. Um, but in, in answer to the question, you know, did, what crimes uh, were caused by the casinos? I think there's this, this slight increase, at least, in in drunk driving in the area. Um, and the others, I thought I explained well enough that I didn't need a, additional visuals on. But are there any questions about these trends before I move on to Everett? Um, uh, Professor Bruce, would you mind just um could you just minimize the slides so that we could see everyone oh, so sure. I could call on people, please? Thank you. So I do know your slideshow goes right into the Everett area, and I know that there's interrelated analysis, so thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, um, our guests, if you also have questions, I want you to chime in, my fellow commissioners too. So um, it will be trickier um, to have guests chime in. So I'm gonna pause in sort of an unnatural way. Um, commissioners, if we can allow our guests to ask their questions first. Um, anyone want, wish to, to start? Okay. Then why don't we go with the commissioner's questions and that might actually ask for some follow-up questions from guests. Commissioner Cameron, would you like to chime in? Yes, I would, thank you. Um, as you all know, I always, this project is really important. Um, I find it really important. It's important for a number of reasons. Um, Professor Bruce, um, or rather, um, Director Vanderlinden started by saying, you know, we know the history, we know all about um, Atlantic City and Nevada, uh, Las Vegas, what the, what the issues around crime were, but we really don't know much about what's, what's happening right now because studies like this really haven't occurred. So that's one of the reasons this is really, and Springfield in particular, I don't know how many public meetings when we were deciding who would get the license, we heard from the public about the safety. Will it be safe in, in downtown Springfield? That was a constant comment that we heard. And um, I, just, I just look at this as a very good news report for many reasons. One, um, first of all, I'm, I'm just uh, very grateful for the executives that are here, the commissioner and staff and other chiefs, just 
taking the interest, and they've done this from day one. Um, uh, Christopher pointed out that this is the region that everybody participates, that they get their data in, they all, there are no, uh, there are no exceptions, all the surrounding communities. And I think they have provided invaluable um, just feedback. It would be much harder for Professor Bruce to come to any kind of real conclusions without the chiefs in the room saying, hey, no, 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 let me tell you what that was all about. Because you can't always tell from the numbers, right? So those meetings are critical to making sure this project is as accurate as possible. Uh, and I, I know it's much too early to draw conclusions um, about crime, um, you know, has it gone up, has it gone down? But the trends are really strong. And I, and I do attribute a lot of that to uh, the work of the state and local surrounding communities, Springfield PD. They have worked um, not only to keep it safe, but they have really looked at this as a responsibility they take seriously. And this project is just one example of how hard they work to keep it safe um, for their community. So I, um, once again, this is promising. And the other thing I wanted to point out, although it's dated, this report, uh, Christopher Bruce does work closely with the crime analysts and the members of the PDs. And so if he sees something early on, he'll be in touch. So they know well before this report what's happening and they know what's happening in their communities to begin with but they know that he will be there he reaches out he works with the other crime analysts to look at trends or anything going on in pretty much real time maybe a little bit behind real time so i just wanted to thank all the pds and and just the show from the top here it really makes a difference that this project is important so i just want to thank everyone for being here and how hard you work to keep the community safe Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I agree with everything Commissioner Cameron said, in particular, um, the ongoing commitment and cooperation of all the communities that surround MGM. It is in the meetings that we, you know, gather to go over the report so that um, Christopher Bruce can determine whether there's any other information that he needs or affects what he's doing. Um, I've been impressed with consistently how the communities are in and around Springfield participate. Um, I think it, it does bode well for um, the ongoing project in terms of, you know, it's only as good as the data that you get and the cooperation that you get. And so I, I just, I think that bears repeating in terms of thanking their participation. Um, and I, I think it's a worthwhile study too, as we go forward and, and are able to get more data and do deeper dives in various uh, offenses or areas, whether there's other things to be learned from this study as we go forward. So I think it's a, it's a great project. Commissioner Sunuka, before we turn to our guests again. Yeah, thank you. Um, a great summary, uh, Christopher, and, and, and also good, uh, agree with the comments from uh, Commissioner Cameron and Ryan. I, um, I want to just pick up on one thing, um, uh, Christopher, that you mentioned in your, early in your presentation, and that is the ability to respond in real time as, 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 as much as we uh, can given um, the analysis that, that you help us compile. And, um, and I wonder if, in your opinion, um, the, the incidents that you highlight relative to the CVS and the, uh, and the gas station uh, uh, merits something, a particular focus, or, or frankly, has there already been, you know, that, has that already been identified to the, to the chiefs and other stakeholders like the GEU? to merit um, some additional surveillance or, or, or procedures? Well, you, well, you, one of the things I would about? say is that the numbers at the, um, first of all, the, 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 the crime at the CVS is only notable for the fact that it simply didn't exist before. Uh, the statistics that actually are happening there are not, in my opinion, terribly high for a CVS. Uh, I've, I've I'd have to, you know, collect data from multiple communities, but I've worked in communities that had CVSs before, and uh, they're, you know, they're very popular businesses, and they um, they have a certain amount of, of criminal activity inevitably. I, I don't think the the one across from MGM is is notably high, and the same with the gas station. It's only really notable in that it it went a lot higher than it used to be. Uh, the Springfield Police Department would have to comment on anything being done in particular at those locations, but if 
if I wasn't looking at the, them uh, in a before and after sense, I wouldn't I wouldn't think that this the numbers coming from those two places are are particularly high objectively, ju just in comparison to what they were before. Thank you. So I just have a, a, a couple of observations. I thought um, it's really interesting. First off, I, I have to agree with what all of my commissioners, fellow commissioners said. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Commissioner Cameron, you know, I think the report suggests this is, this is all very good news, right? Of course, right now we are in a, in a we've had a, this covers the last three months, um, or three months of COVID, that, that um, of course means a different analysis. So, but what I thought was a big takeaway is in the, um, the very positive way that you frame it, um, Christopher, by saying that, you know, with all the additional guests to Springfield, all the additional foot traffic to Springfield, with that comes activity, and um, we know it comes economic driving benefits, of course, but with it, it comes perhaps an uh, unexpected benefit of the natural guardians. Mm -hmm. I also agree with, I think, what both Commissioner um, O'Brien and Commissioner Kim are saying is that we also know it does come with the benefit of vigilance from the, the law enforcement community. And so I just wondered, um, Captain Connors, I see you're here. I know that we have the other guests who might be able to quantify. It, it, it must be hard to know how much is that natural guardian versus how much is, uh, as you've already noted, more enforcement, um, more vigilance um, because of the expectation of more people. You know, if my question isn't clear, the natural guardian and, and plus, is there a, a way to quantify the additional amount of, of law enforcement that has been, you know, has been added um, pre-COVID perhaps? that uh, shows the benefit of additional law enforcement? There, there, it might be possible to construct a model that, that would account for those variables, but it would be very, very difficult, I think. And I, I, I would, personally, if I were to try to divide, um, if I was trying to divide the credit between those two factors, I would need to know th things like exactly, you know, where, where officers were patrolling in the areas and for how many hours and, and uh, so I think I think the police themselves would be more equipped to take a, a sort of a basic um, guess at the at the question. I don't know exactly how I would do it mathematically with the available data that I have. Well, what is fascinating is the takeaway that it is law enforcement plus this other, you know, where there's where there's community, where there's foot traffic, where there are people. It's not necessarily doesn't necessarily equate with an increase in crime. Exactly. But there's this notion of natural guardianship. I had one back question that I might have missed um, in your narrative. Um, I think it was near your last slide on the last drink. You indicated for the adjudication seven times um, uh, the um, yeah. uh, defendant noted the last drink. Do you happen to know the number of adjudications so we can put some context to that? Uh, great uh, question. I don't. And okay. uh, so everything I titled in, in my, the sections of these, of both reports, I, I titled this section on drunk, uh, drinking uh, preliminary analysis because uh, what I've a, I'm going to ask the uh, ABCC for is, is basically just their entire data set. So I can actually calculate the, the numbers adjudicated in, in which they mentioned the casinos as a ratio of the total number of adjudications. I also wanted to simply compare it to other top locations. You know, yes. what is the what are the actual top locations in Massachusetts? Where do the casinos rank in that list and, and things like that? I don't uh, I don't have that that totality of data yet, so I can't offer that yet. But we're doing a, a special report on the issue of drunk driving, and and that will definitely be included there. Yeah, I think that'll be really helpful. Yeah. Thanks. I agree. Um, the, the number, the raw number by itself, isn't isn't that useful? Um, so for our guests, before we move on to the um, to Encore and the Everett community and surrounding communities, um, do you have any questions for Christopher at this time, or do you have any comments or observations you want to share, oh, Commissioner Zuniga? 
Uh, I'm just identifying. There seems to be one. I just wanted to oh, make sure. Oh yeah. So that. sorry. I thought you were chiming in. Yes, I see from from Springfield. Thank yeah. you. Yes, yeah. I see you. Yeah, a new Zoom. We're kind of far away, <laughs> but um, on behalf of the Springfield Police Department, thank you for having this and inviting us. And I, I my comment would be that we are certainly committed um, in Springfield to MGM. We have maintained uh, a metro unit division of police officers that's specifically patrol within the half mile area of the casino. And, we, and despite COVID and despite the police department having its issues and manpower issues, we've been able to maintain that. We're proud of that. And we thought it was important, even when the casino was not operating at full capacity or even half capacity, we made sure that no property damage and, and people still felt safe in the area. That was important to us. And the CVS uh, professor versus Wright it's brand new, so it was tough for us too to adapt to that, but I think we, we have now and we do pay special attention to it. And the pride, COVID brought out another problem and it was a rise in drug abuse and, and people out and about because they could no longer go to uh, clinics. They were no longer getting support. They were no longer getting counseling. So a lot more people were out on the street and some places closed down and that pride happened to stay open. So it may be one of the very few places that are open 24 hours. So it attracted uh, a little bit more of a component than what it normally would have. But, but we are attuned to that problem also. And, and again, I thank you for having us. Well, we thank you for, for coming. And that's a really important observation that you shared with respect to the rise in the in the issues around uh, drug abuse and lack really of the, of the supports because of, of uh, the unfortunate impact of COVID. So uh, thank you for sharing that, Commander. And um, any other uh, comments before, and of course you could chime in too if you stay on for the, the next part of um, Christopher's uh, report, you could chime in of course um, at the, again, so. We'll move on then, I guess. Am I, I'm not missing anyone? Excellent, thank you. You'll need to share your slides again, yeah. uh, Professor, thank you. Okay, um, so in the Everett area, uh, we've had a few more, uh, uh, we've had it, problems getting some of the data that uh, didn't exist in uh, the Springfield area. Um, a couple of agencies, in, including uh, Medford and um, uh, Cambridge uh, just um, declined to participate in, in the study uh, and I, I can understand I, I asked for a, a a level of detail of, of the the data that some of the agencies are uncomfortable uh, contributing uh, Medford I don't think is a lost cause necessarily but they uh, uh, might need to have some more reassurances um, Malden uh, has, is participating, but uh, we just couldn't get the data from them for this particular round of, of the study because uh, the personnel uh, that would have needed to help me obtain it were working from home because of COVID and, and didn't have access to it. The good news is that I brought uh, Saugus um, on board and so they joined the, the study. They were an obvious hole here in the in the map. And I, I apologize, I forgot to replace this map. This is from the, the previous presentation, but so Malden should be colored as not being uh, present, but Saugus uh, is. And so during this period, uh, we I saw very, very few uh, significant increases in the surrounding area, much, much fewer than in the Springfield area. And some of the things that we did see, uh, thefts from vehicles were, higher than expected in Boston and uh, and Everett. In Boston, I, I mean specifically in Charlestown because that's the only neighborhood that I'm getting data for. Uh, both patterns continued though into the COVID period, uh, even, at, even when the casino was closed. And in neither case were the statistics really uh, high. It's just that the trend had been decreasing so fast in those communities that the number in this period outperformed where I expected, where the mathematics expected uh, the trend to go. 
given how fast it was decreasing. So it's it's more probable to me, I think, that they just hit a sort of a natural floor in the number of incidents that were reported and the trend is sort of smoothing out than Encore caused anything specifically in that. Uh, a couple of weird uh, crimes that we don't normally, uh, I, I normally wouldn't have even measured, except that it doesn't take any extra effort to measure them. Uh, so statutory rape was oddly high in Chelsea, Somerville, and Lynn. Again, no logical connection to Encore. If it was happening at hotels immediately in the area, I might think, okay, maybe some minors are being lured to, um, uh, to hotels or something, but they were all residences and seemed to involve uh, other uh, minors in many cases and no, no casino nexus at all. And the same with prostitution. You know, that's something that you obviously want to watch for. In a, in a casino area, but uh, in this case, the, the increase for the region was concentrated solely in Lynn and in, in one particular uh, intersection of Lynn. And uh, I think that it, 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 based on my discussions with the Lynn police, uh, it just had to do with extra enforcement uh, of that intersection by the, the Lynn police itself. Liquor laws uh, increased in Lynn and Everett, but the similar reasons for Springfield, they just seem to be making more traffic stops in which they're finding open containers. And Melrose, I didn't hear back from them on this issue, uh, so I, I have to leave it open for the next report. But they saw an increase in, in, in when I say increase, we're, we're not talking about big numbers to begin with, but uh, in a few assaults and uh, findings of drugs, and even a couple of fraud incidents, which uh, are, are kind of interesting, at the hospital they have. I know the hospital is one of the potential destinations for anybody uh, who, has an ambulance at the casino. So I, I left it to Melrose to look at those reports and offer if um, any of the, they could identify that any of those people uh, had come from the casino and they haven't reported back on that yet. So that's a, that's a possible. Right around the casino, the immediate area, there's some evidence of a general increase in calls for service uh, for things like disorder and noise. I have the specific numbers uh, coming up in, in just a bit. They could be have a, a relationship, but it's it's worth pointing out that Encore isn't quite like MGM. I mean, they're both in sort of a busy-ish downtown, or not, I wouldn't call that part of Everett downtown exactly. They're in a busy-ish urban area, but MGM is right there on the street. People walk to it. They, uh, It's part of the, the businesses that surround it. Uh, whereas Encore is a little bit you know, much more set back from the, the road. I don't think you're, you're getting as, anywhere near as much foot traffic uh, to, the, to the casino. It's not really part of a business um, establishment within the area. Uh, and, and for that reason, the, it, it seems to me less likely that people would be spilling out of Encore and and doing anything in the surrounding area other than getting in their cars and uh, and driving home. Uh, Everett's on the on the line. Maybe they can comment on that particular dynamic. But we'll look at the statistics in, in just a bit. Everything else, car, uh, crimes, calls, collisions, have been completely normal uh, in in this particular area. Here's a, a map of the thefts from vehicles in, in Charlestown. They're having a lot more in, in what are. Uh, I mean, no part of this part of Boston is really entirely residential, but they're basically residential streets where uh, where people live, not so much concentrated in, say, you know, commercial uh, parking lots. Um, but once again, these are not particularly high numbers. They're just higher than the, the trend would have indicated. Here, here are the statistics at Melrose Wakefield Hospital. So you see 2020 was the uh, uh, highest in uh, an eight-year period with 18 crimes reported there so again not not huge numbers but above the norm and if they can if, if melrose can show that they're getting more uh patients coming from encore then that would um uh, and i'm sorry the, these years are the years ending february the end of february for those years so this when, when it says 2019 that means march 1st 2018 through the end of february 2019 and the same with with 2020 and beyond. Uh, and as far as the surrounding area, I had divided it up into three um, analysis areas. Uh, I expected there would be some increase of, in things at this shopping center just to the west of Encore because it's just the closest concentration of restaurants and stores uh, and you know other uh, types of facilities 
that visitors might want to to patronize, I thought they'd see an increase in visitors and therefore an inevitable increase in crime, but literally nothing has gone up in that area. It's it's not easy to get to from Encore, even though they're right next door. There isn't like an official path that takes you over there. Uh, so you'd have to go back up to the to Route 16 and over. That might explain why they're not experiencing much of anything. This uh, sort of mixed residential commercial area to the east of uh, the casino uh, has seen an issue with some assaults on the street, uh, drunk driving, which we'll cover in a bit, uh, a lot of calls for suspicious activity, and a ge just a general increase in, in calls for service. Uh, there was a particular issue with tr traffic uh, parking complaints there during the first six months, but it didn't continue in the subsequent two months. And this northern area here also saw an increase in, in the types of crimes that you see, the specific numbers are offered in the report. The, it's possible there are, some of those increases are related to the casino. Um, again, this is not, it's not like the Springfield area though. I, it's hard to see people walking out of the casino and making their way into this, this neighborhood, but I might be wrong uh, and Everett might want to comment on that. Uh, so there all, while there is a logical connection to some of these call for service types, and the extra traffic that a casino would bring, I'm still I, I'm more skeptical than I am of some of the other uh, trends that we see in in my reports. Now I also looked at a few other geographies within the report itself, the travel routes along uh, Route One and uh, Main Street through uh, Everett and uh, Malden and Melrose uh, coming in uh, to the the casino area, and didn't really see much of anything. Uh, along those routes. And the travel routes are something that particularly interests me because I expect as more people uh, visit these casinos, they're going to be stopping at restaurants and convenience stores and uh, gas stations and so forth along the major travel routes. But so far, I have not found any increase uh, in any of the casino areas on those those particular travel routes. Now, this is an, the drunk driving uh, part of this is interesting because there's a lot more uh, evidence on the surface of an, an increase in this area. Uh, Everett's arrests for drunk driving were up more than, than 100% during the first eight months that, uh, that Encore was open, and then they went down 50% from the norm during the, the COVID closure period. When you come to the, the incidents that were reported as crashes, uh, they increased from virtually none at all uh, to to 17 during the casino period, and then went down 15 to 75 percent during the closure period. There's a particular geographic concentration of incidents on Broadway, which I have here, so you can see the, the casino. And these these again are just crashes that turned out to be caused by a a drunk driver, and you can see that line right along uh, along Broadway here. Uh, Encore was listed as the last drink location by, like MGM, seven drunk drivers uh, adjudicated during this this period. Uh, now they could those drunk drivers could have been arrested anywhere. I don't know when they, where they were arrested. They could have been arrested in Boston or South Shore or any place. Um, however, so there's a, there's a lot of smoke coming out of this area when it comes to drunk driving. But uh, Everett police themselves have gone through their the, these. Uh, drunk driving arrests reported as crashes and found that uh, none of the drunk drivers have reported uh, Encore as their last drink location when they reported something at all. So uh, it's one of those things, like I say, a lot of smoke. Every time I talk to the every police, they say, no, there's no fire, uh, but I have to keep checking because the, the, the statistics are so uh, stark for this area. Again, this is something that I'll look at more uh, in more detail in the drunk driving report where I get a total data set from ABCC and ideally um, last drink locations from from all of the uh, the surrounding communities and we can put all the evidence together uh, so I, I would I would say there's reasons to be a, a little bit concerned but based on Everett's own analysis the the increase doesn't seem to be uh, casino specific despite the geographic proximity and let's move into the, the COVID closures. I have a broader section of this in the report. I didn't think you know, it was worth spending a lot of time talking about it uh, today, but basically 
during the three months, uh, the four months that um, Encore was closed, uh, I'm sorry, that all the casinos were closed. In the MGM area, violent crime went down 28%. Uh, Encore Boston Harbor area, 16%. Property crime went down 9% in the MGM area. But, and this is based on the predicted uh, number that, that, that I thought they would have had uh, normally. And crashes, an incredible decrease, 51% in the MGM area and 43% in the Encore area. Of course, I am not suggesting, and nobody should take from this, that it was the closure of the casinos that caused these, these decreases specifically. Everything was closed during this period. People are working from home, get schools closed, bars closed, restaurants everything and uh the fundamental routine activities of society changed uh significantly and that really is what's to to credit for the decrease we're seeing the same types of statistics nationally and some some places across the country have reported an increase in um in drunk uh, domestic violence during this period, but I didn't see any evidence of this in, in these two regions. So uh, th this created a fundamental shift in, in the way people interact with their environment and interact with each other that didn't entirely go away uh, when the casinos reopened. Opened. Now, I, I, as I said, I started the MGM analysis in the summer. The casinos really had not been open uh, that long then, and, and I don't have statistics for the, the full reopening period. I do for Encore. Uh, violent crime is still very low uh, since the, the casinos reopened. Uh, thefts from vehicles are still high. They were high throughout the period. Uh, in this, this case, it's Revere in Boston, not Everett in Boston, where they're high. And we see increases in, in various types of theft, fraud credit card fraud and, and identity theft. But again, many of those crimes seem to be having a, a statewide increase as well. Collisions are still way down. Uh, and it's too, it's too early to get comparative data from other agencies for the, this period, for bo both periods, both the, the closing and the reopening period. And I think I'm gonna really need that comparative data to, to model what to expect going forward because even though the casinos have reopened, they've reopened, as we all know here, from lim at a limited capacity. And not only that, a lot of other places haven't reopened. Uh, so the those routine activities of society that I talked about are still heavily restricted uh, across the you know the, around the world. Uh, this is going to be a major issue for police departments uh, worldwide going forward. How do you how do you compare what happened? You know, how, how do you compare your statistics when when these restrictions are finally lifted to what happened before? I, I think you a lot of the, them are simply going to have to ignore uh, 2020 and 2021 in their in their tr uh, trend lines and their crime statistics because things change so much on a on a global scale. And uh, it's nice. It'll be nice to think that 2022. Uh, is back to normal for all of us. I I think it might be too early to make that uh, uh, that type of proclamation. So basic, this throws you know the whole uh, future of of the project into doubt a little bit, because this is one of those situations where what's happening at the casinos isn't, or the the the, the increase in crime in the surrounding areas surrounding the casinos isn't high enough that it's going to stand out against the decreases that are being occasioned by uh, these major changes in, in society. And in order to detect a casino influence on the surrounding areas going forward, uh, I'm going to have to create uh, very different models. And there isn't really a research consensus on how best to do that. Uh, so um, it's still it's still a work in progress, I suppose, is the best way to say it. And uh, I, I don't know the full answer, but hopefully I will by the next time I have to uh, to report to you all. Um, so for the the next steps, uh, I I'd want to try to get Malden and Medford back in, get their data, and see if anything uh, changes. Uh, Boston has had uh, some limited 
data availability since they changed to a new records management system. And so I've got to try to get more data from them. And you'll see some limitations in the report about the Boston data specifically. Um, we're going to be talking uh, coming up about incidents at the casinos themselves, uh, which I, I've left out of these reports because of some concerns with the data. And uh, uh, Director Vanderlinden has uh, convened a, a meeting to with the inter the stakeholders to talk about that and to to work through some of the the issues. But the most important thing is to create a model to figure out how to analyze this data uh, during the period in which COVID is still basically affecting what happens I I everywhere in our communities, not just at the the casino. And uh, my next major report should be a multi-area drunk driving analysis that covers all three casino areas uh, s since the beginning, going back to uh, the opening even of Plain Ridge Park, uh, to summarize all of the evidence that we have uh, or don't have on, on drunk driving and uh, to the extent to which that has increased in the, in the casino period. And that is my report. I'll stop sharing and see everybody's faces again. And are there any questions for me? Looks like Kathy, Kathy, you might be speaking, but you're. Yeah. Oh, no, I wasn't. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought <laughs> I'm I saw joking. You joking. Just joking. Uh, um, I think that perhaps some of our guests are either not on video or not, but I do want to give them the opportunity to chime in. We'll have a sort of a natural pause right now. See if anybody chimes in before the commissioners. While they're collecting their thoughts, I'm sorry, just give me uh, less than 20 seconds. Okay. Um, on page two, I don't see any faces, so here we are. Um, the business of home continues. I'm back, sorry. Oh, no, no problem. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, would you like to go first this time um, with comments, or are you want to hold on? Uh, no, certainly. Um, I mean, I think the, the earlier comments about the importance of it hold true for this one as well. Um, unfortunately, we can't say we have the um, sort of universal participation that I would love to be able to say we had, like we do out in Springfield. It's something that we continue to work on. I know we've spoken about how to try to get greater participation and it is something that I'd like to continue to get more involved in in terms of it would really be great to see, um, you know, Cambridge in particular participate, um, work out the issues that Boston has with their stats because there is a, you know, we are so right on the line with Boston. I do think that's a critical part of this as well that I think Christopher's gonna wanna need going forward to make this continue to be relevant. Um, Right. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Cameron or Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah, I, I would just like to say that, um, again, I think this is a, a, uh, a report that trends in, in the right direction, meaning we don't see huge levels of uh, increase in crime. I, I know when we first heard about the drunk driving on uh, Broadway, it looked like it could really be problematic, but then after listening to the very thorough analysis done, done by Everett PD, um, really thorough about each one and asking those questions about where were you, it didn't seem at all to be uh, related to the casino. So again, I think that information from the departments is invaluable um, to this report. And um, I just, again, want to thank everyone involved, uh, state police, and Herbert PD and all the surrounding areas. And I do agree with Commissioner O'Brien. It would be nice to get everybody involved uh, if we could, but, uh, but, a, but a big thanks to everybody. Thank you, Commissioner Zunica. Uh, just to reiterate the same point, uh, I know why um, there's uh, different concerns and some logistical issues relative to participation, including you know, working from home in the case of Malden. But um, 
I join my voice to the chorus of trying to persuade and, and address uh, uh, communities concerns um, to the extent they can be addressed, uh, uh, you know, without compromising the integrity of the of the of the project, of course, um, to, to to for the benefit of everybody. But uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, uh, Christopher. Um, great work. Thank uh, thank you so much again. Um, echoing the um, broader thanks to the communities that support the work that. Christopher presented. Um, I think I see that Chief Dunn is at least still here and he may be listening, but I think um, Commissioner O'Brien, as you lead up this work with Commissioner Cameron, that perhaps we want to keep him um, um, as part of our um, stakeholders if he hasn't been already and, and informed because you know, I'm hearing uh, from Christopher that there are these statewide trends that we need to look um, at and given his role with the, um, the, the statewide association, that might be really helpful uh, to keep him updated with our work. Um, you know, particularly, I guess you're, you're focusing on the, the identity fraud and, and credit card fraud and the, the fraudulent practice that we're, might be just all sort of trending across the state in the same fashion. Uh, again, excellent report, um, I think, it continues to be good news, and in many ways, it's um, a factor of all the efforts from the law enforcement community, as well as um, from you know the the patrons who attend, and the folks um, who are doing the work on the floor, including our own uh, uh, game enforcement unit and um, game agents. So, thank you, uh, Captain Connors. Did you want to chime in? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I want to make sure if you have anything you'd like to add. No, uh, thank you for the time. Uh, no, just uh, we'll continue to work with, uh, with Christopher and getting the information for the future reports, uh, especially as they relate to the facilities themselves and what we're seeing there. But um, yeah, we'll continue to, to get that in a place that we want to make sure that these numbers reflect accurately what we're seeing within the within the facilities and making sure that the numbers either with the local our local partners that. Plainville, Everett, and Springfield are accurately reflective and not duplicating them. So we, we have a, a, a picture as to what's going on within the facility. Great, yes, we look forward to that, that good work ahead. Okay, um, I want to make sure for any guests that they don't have any questions or comments. Then I think, um, um, you know, uh, to Christopher, Professor, Bruce, thank you for your presentation. Director Vanderlinden, we have a busy day. Do you have any concluding remarks? No, I think he's, he's covered it well. And um, other than that, just I, a sincere thank you to everybody that's uh, been involved, both within the MGC, but most particularly our law enforcement partners in this. Um, this, is, this is, when we think about who is this research for, who's our target audience? Um, you're our target audience. And so your investment contributing to it and benefiting from it is, um, is our priority. Yeah, thank you. And again, a, a thank you to uh, the elected state officials who um, may have attended or sent representatives. Uh, we will continue to keep you in the loop and apprised of these developments and these reports, um, as well as to the two mayor's offices. Um, um, you know, you certainly know how to reach Director Vanderlinden and my fellow commissioners and me. So we look forward to keeping you fully apprised on, on these discussions. So thank you. Um, I think then we'll move on to our, our next item on the agenda. I'm bringing up right now. So that now uh, we're at item number five and uh, Joe Delaney, our community affairs division chief we're going to be exploring um, some workforce employment policy questions that uh, were raised in earlier commission meetings. So thank you for the follow-up, Joe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, so of course the subject we have before you today involves our licensees, policies and procedures um, with respect to recalling those workers that have been furloughed or laid off <clears throat> due to the pandemic. 
Um, this issue first came up back in February when we were uh, doing our licensees, our quarterly reports. And at that time, uh, the discussion revolved you know, primarily around uh, women participation in the workforce and whether or not there were ways to expedite the return of some of these folks to the workplace you know, without the loss of seniority status. Um, so this issue has become particularly important in light of the fact that Massachusetts schools are going back to full-time in-person learning, uh, which may free up some of those uh, folks who may not have been able to go back to work due to children being at home. And also the return of uh, craps and the recent um, approval of additional seats at the table games is expected to result in the need for um, additional dealers and cocktail servers, which will of course necessitate uh, some hiring by our licensees. So here with us today uh, to address these issues, we have Seth Stratton from MGM and Jackie Crum from Encore. And while the table games uh, it, uh, don't really affect uh, PPC directly, I did ask North Ground Cell to be here uh, to answer any questions if you should have them uh, of PPC. And at this point, I'd like to just turn it back to the chair to see if there's anything that you want to add in uh, if I missed any of the salient points um, before we hear from our licensees. Um, absolute great summary. I do see that uh, we have Kathy Lucas here too. I want to acknowledge, hi Kathy, nice to see you. Um, I, you know, I think that um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, um, Commissioner O'Brien who has led this conversation. I, I will add that um, it is probably a conversation that um, is followed closely and aligned with uh, Commissioner Cameron and, and me. Um, we are, I think, thinking about our female counterparts who want to be at work and are, have faced uh, uh, obstacles that you know, we haven't had to necessarily face, they are facing. So we're, we um, monitor workforce issues with the three properties. And so we are looking forward to this update, but Commissioner O'Brien, if you want to frame out the question again for those who may not be as familiar with your initial inquiry. Um, certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to Joe and to licensees for this discussion today. I think it's particularly timely when I realized that yesterday was um, Women's Equal Pay Day, which is, you know, took this far into 2021 for most women across the states to basically make what a male had made last year. And one of the things that I think struck all of us when this first came up at the quarterlies was the drop in female participation. When you looked at the diversity numbers and COVID has disproportionately impacted women and there's a lot of concern about their ability to get back into the workforce. And so I wanted a deeper dive into what some of those reasons were at the licensees. And I understand from a, a quick briefing and I'm sure they'll get into it more today that there are you know, certain factors in terms of there are collective bargaining agreements, there are things like that that play into seniority and how people are called back. But I do, A, want to hear about what those are and B, um, talk about having an ongoing conversation about this because as the economy gets back up and running and as they look for employees, um, I do want us to continue the focus that we have in the commitment to um, all diversity in terms of getting people back to work and doing what we can do um, in conjunction with the licensees to make sure that um, we don't leave anyone left behind if it's at all possible. So with that, I, I would, um, unless anyone else has comments, I would love to hear from them in terms of what their practices are, what they're seeing on the ground, and maybe ideas for what we can do to make sure people don't get lost. Jackie, I'm happy to jump in with our team first, as I know this has been a discussion that started with the MGM Springfield team, if you'd like. Sure. Thank you, Correct. Seth. Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to introduce and, and largely turn it over to our, our team because this is a, we as a company are committed, of course, to uh, equity across all of our employees and, and our female employees. Um, this is an, an issue that has, uh, you know, a number of factors and is situational depending on the particular circumstance. But um, we took the inquiry seriously, seriously. Uh, did a deep dive and, and looped in several of our corporate partners who look at these issues across the enterprise, and we've invited them here today to participate. Uh, in particular, um, Wendy Nutt um, from, from our corporate team, uh, labor, labor Relations, and um, Rick Jost from uh, Corporate HR. 
I'd ask um, Wendy and Rick if you could just briefly introduce yourselves and and um, give a little bit more detail on your role, and then I'll turn it over uh, to both of you to um, address the issue generally, and then the, uh, our team is here to answer any questions, if that makes sense. Thank you. So, uh, Rick and, and Wendy, go ahead. Sure. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Wendy Nutt. Uh, I am Senior Vice President of Labor Strategy, and my role in to, to really drive the overall labor relations strategy for the organization. Um, my team and I do all of our labor negotiations across the, the United States. Um, uh, I have a team member who leads uh, the Massachusetts negotiations for me, um, but uh, obviously uh, all of that rolls up to me for approvals and to ensure that our, our labor relations negotiations are consistent with our overall approach on labor. I obviously work very closely with our um, HR uh, teams on on things like the the shutdown and the resumption of operations as that to our unionized workforce. So Rick, uh, who is going to also is also here today, uh, Rick Jost is, is somebody I work with very closely. I'll, I will let him introduce himself. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, so I'm Rick Jost. I'm a vice president of Human Resources. Um, I've been with MGM Resorts for 14 years. Um, most of the, the time in my career, I've been closely aligned with the resorts and the properties that we operate, providing human resources support. Um, more recently, though, for the last 14 months, um, I've specifically been involved, um, as Wendy indicated, in looking at policies um, related to the pandemic, the shutdown, um, the reopening, uh, and just making sure that our, our policies were consistent across the, um, the eight states that we operate in. The, you know, over 100 uh, collective bargaining agreements that Wendy and her team manage, uh, making sure that we were being thoughtful about um, the ways that our policies needed to adapt um, because of the environment that we were in um, and uh, caring for employees along the way to ensure that we we're doing everything we could to support them. Um, I want to make sure. Is that, is that, am I frozen? Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback. There's an echo, Kathy. That's strange. Yeah, I did. Um, I did mute somebody, and I wonder if that was a factor. I'll try that. Maybe that was it. I don't know where it's coming from. Okay, there we go. Uh, Seth, if you want to take the uh, conversation forward, please. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair. I... Can everybody hear me now? Yep. I think we had we have one person, Mary Pulgarin, I who hadn't muted, and I muted her. I don't know if she could mute herself. Oh, you're, you might be hearing through her. There we go. Does that help? Okay. Anyway, we'll continue now. Uh, so, Seth, you've introduced, I think the question would be quite practical. What are the, um, what will we expect on reports for the next quarterly in terms of bringing in women? What are the challenges? I'm hearing that there's probably a, a union issue for you. And I'm sorry about the feed. Yeah, and if we could try, if, if Wendy, it might be yours. Could you try muting yourself, Wendy? That might be yours. Try that, Kathy. Yeah, I, that helps. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that Thank helps. Derek, I don't know Derek the, figured it out. I'll give Derek the credit for that. Oh, good. Thank you, Derek. Always observing. So I'm glad it's not me because that would have been a long day. Um, <laughs> however, I'm going to mute me, myself when Wendy speaks and that and hopefully that will help. We didn't have an echo when Wendy spoke. So Seth, I think um, sure. if you could take yeah. the conversation forward. Thank you. Sure. Sir, I think to, uh, and I'll turn it back over to Rick just to give a high level overview of of our process, but I moving forward, I think you're going to see the number continue to to fluctuate. Um, you will see, hopefully, as we we reopen our 
hotel, which has been closed and open on a limited basis uh, for a period of time, you will see um, that a lot of those positions um, related to the hotel have a higher um, pro rata percentage of female employees. So you'll see some increase there. Um, we also, however, factor in the numbers with respect to the Mass Mutual Center operations. And luckily, as we move into phase four and you see that operation ramp up, um, you'll see folks come back there. And um, the, it, the percentage of employees over there ha happens to be higher, um, higher male. So those might even out. So I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where the numbers will go um, going forward, but we are, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that our recall process doesn't um, disproportionately impact any category of employee. And, and I guess, Rick, if you could just um, give a very, we've been on several conversations and we could take three hours to, to walk through our, our process. Um, if you could just give a high level overview of the process that we employ um, and how that works so that we can un understand that they're, um, what we do there uh, and our focus on ensuring that folks who want to come back are able to come back. Absolutely. Thank you. So, um, and this builds off of, I think, the, the conversation in the last meeting that um, Jason had started to explain of, um, we do have clear policies in place, um, whether it's returning employees who may just be in a furlough um, status, for example, people um, who were impacted by the, the curfew in Q4 of 2020, um, as well as a policy and a process for employees who were unfortunately separated on August 31st um, and are being reinstated. Um, and so what I think is really important to understand in both of those processes, um, the, the employees, if they return on their, their first offer, uh, they retain all of their seniority that um, whether it's benefits, 401k, um, um, time off benefits, it, it all um, is restored back to their original corporate seniority with our organization. Um, and Wendy can speak to if there's any intricacies for those that are covered by an agreement, a union agreement about any differences there. Um, but that, that first offer, people um, automatically get all of that seniority back. Um, I understand from the February meeting, part of the conversation was around if they've declined once and, and then later um, come back to join us, do they in effect lose their seniority? So I, I did want to clarify, um, most of everything I just described would still be available to them if they come back to join uh, MGM Resorts Springfield or, or any MGM Resorts entity for that matter prior to the end of 2021. So between now and December 31st, 2021, whether an employee is recalled um, or if they are rehired into the organization, um, they would keep their corporate seniority, um, which for most of our employees is the triggering factor for the benefits, the health benefits, the 401k and the time off benefits. Um, the, the only thing that someone might lose if they had declined the offer previously um, as Jason had described, and so we had continued offering down the, the list and then later they were rehired. The, the only seniority that would be impacted would be their position seniority um, because there, there is a break in service at that point that they declined work when, when others accepted it. Um, so our policies do make a distinction there. Um, and again, I, I don't wanna get too far into the weeds on that um, because I, I think you know, Wendy can speak to where the, the different seniority dates might affect the uh, employees that are represented by a collective bargaining agreement. Um, but I did want to make sure that we we're clear that um, you know it's in our best interest to get those employees um, rehired as business rebounds, and we have um, the roles available to them because they're already licensed and trained. Um, but um, even if someone had originally declined, um, they are still going to uh, receive most of their seniority back in what I believe would be the seniority that's probably most impactful for their benefits. <laughs> Commissioner yeah. yeah, just a quick question to clarify to uh, to make sure I don't didn't miss um, a date. You said, Mr. Jones. Um, so you have that policy in place um, for all of 2021 yes, until December correct. December of this year. In other words, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could, this is Commissioner O'Brien, uh, Mr. Jones. If the break in service, can you be a little more specific about what the loss of seniority in terms of their position seniority would be? You're telling me it's not necessarily gonna be related to 
benefits, what are some of the ramifications if you lose that due to the break in service? Absolutely. So what I'd suggest is I'll answer it for an employee that's not represented by a, um, a union and then I'll allow Wendy to weigh in um, on the difference there. So for um, for an employee that's not represented, um, what position seniority would most often be used for would be bidding on shifts. So um, an employee who comes back and has a new position seniority date, um, the, the next time that the shifts go up for bid and that people are um, able to um, apply for different schedules, uh, they would have a different seniority than they would have had previously because they've essentially reset to the, the bottom of that list when bidding on um, any available shifts. Wendy, do you want to speak to um, what the bargaining agreements would say? Yeah, and the, the collective bargaining agreements are pretty consistent with what Rick said around those that aren't represented. Uh, you know, the, the agreements have various you know, things that, that, that are driven by seniority throughout the contracts, but primarily what you see around a classification uh, seniority date is bidding on shifts and schedules um, that it would include like days off, et cetera. So we, if we bid a whole schedule, um, if you are in an on-call role, it will drive the order in which you are offered available work, for example, um, and, and uh, you know, it may drive promotional opportunities to a certain extent. And we look at oftentimes as promotional opportunities just including moving from, you know, equal classification across the, the bargaining unit. So somebody, you know, wants to move from a guest room attendant into a, to a, a food server position, for example. Um, we would refer to that as, as a type of promotional bargaining or promotional opportunity. But so the, that, that sort of seniority is going to drive the classification or position seniority is going to drive those things. As Rick said, um, for benefits eligibility purposes, that is generally your corporate hire date, which we, we are having people retain um, when they when they come back into the to the workforce. Um, so the, uh, the it is really more the day to day that gets impacted than than the you know sort of the big ticket items around uh, your your benefits when you are working for us. So can I ask the decision to harken back to the initial hire date as the seniority date? Is that a change due to COVID or is that a longstanding practice? Uh, so our, our general policy or existing policy was that um, you need to be rehired uh, into the company within six months of leaving the company to retain that. Um, that's the cutoff that we've used for many years. Um, and so that's a specific example of a policy that we amended in August 2020, uh, 2020 when we understood the, the number of terminations that um, were going to take place uh, and so we modified that policy to create a, a longer, uh, longer runway, if you will, to give employees the opportunity to come back and retain that seniority as business rebounds. Uh, I just, it, it does impact sort of. One, one minute, beyond, gonna, thank you, Wendy, yep. yes. Um, there could be a disproportionate impact beyond sort of the day-to-day -day nuisance in terms of you're talking about shift choices um, or promotional choices. It, it's a little disheartening to hear that that is not also under consideration in terms of if the recall happens within this COVID period, because that does have a real impact on people's um, work experience, promotional experience, et cetera. So just my comment on, on that part of it. I, I, found I, found I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, the challenge for us under a labor agreement is that those people below them also have seniority rights and and as we follow other contracts and, and to be clear so that you all understand we did negotiate memorandums of agreement with each of the unions around what happens because there are contracts simply weren't you know they weren't designed to to deal with a pandemic of, of this magnitude so we have and we have extended recall rights under those contracts we have we allowed people to pass at a, you know for some period of time when we didn't need every but once we've got somebody who has passed and, and someone else comes into the organization, you know, they, they then have seniority rights. So we are very challenged by then bringing somebody back who has exited the organization and now and, and bumping someone back out of where they now sit from a seniority position. Um, so we, we, you know, again, we talk with the union about those things as we go through this and, and try to, bumping gets very, um, there's a lot of room for error when you start bumping and, and changing seniority dates. So I think from a, at least on the union side, that's some of the challenge 
around letting somebody come back who's been out for 10 additional months and, and slotting them back in on a, uh, on a classification or a, a, a position seniority. Right, no, and I acknowledge the CBA is gonna put you in a very different position than at will employees. Um, I would hope that, again, given that it was uh, in all likelihood a COVID decision that extended the separation, um, that maybe there may be ways to strategize um, how to address those, I don't want to call them secondary seniority benefits, but the, the non um, the non benefits related seniority questions. Commissioner Cameron, do you have a question or comment? I, I, I do. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien asked the question I had, which was, was that a longstanding policy or was that something that was modified due to um, the pandemic? My additional question was just um, Vice President Joes, you mentioned at the beginning that you looked at kind of all your policies to see what uh, modifications you could possibly make in light of this. I just wondered if there were any other policies that you have um, um, you have modified due to this pandemic. Uh, absolutely. Um, probably the the one that comes to mind um, as most relevant is our attendance policy. Um, so uh, again, all of our um, operating divisions have policies on uh, a no fault attendance policy and how many um, days someone could take before there would be um, uh, coaching and counseling associated with it. And we recognized obviously very early a year ago that we needed to make modifications because we, we didn't want people coming to, to work sick because they were worried about potential consequences. We wanted them to understand if you have symptoms, it's best for all of us if you stay home. Um, so we, we had initially modified that policy, and then over the last 12 months, we, we've modified it multiple times as the, the environment has changed, right? So most recently, um, we, we've made modifications as uh, employees return to school, or excuse me, employees, uh, children that were returning to school and understood that may create different challenges for them. Um, you know, they might have arrangements that um, change quickly if the child care center or the, the school where they're going has to close down, then that employee is going to be in a position that they need to take time off they weren't expecting. So um, that's another example of a policy that has had addendums a few times over the last 12 months just to continue to understand the situation our employees are facing and um, you know find the, the best way to um, adapt to the environment. Thank you, that's helpful. You're welcome. Okay. <clears throat> Any other further questions? <clears throat> I think it will be fascinating to see um, what the numbers look like. I am hearing the, the, the uh, restraints and the, and the reactions to the CBA and the um, negotiations. Um, thank you for that background. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm sure too that you will continue as you have been to be a committed um, employer to um, enhancing opportunities for women um, in their promotions and in, in giving the kind of outreach and, and uh, training so that they can compete um, in that. And I also know too that I had been concerned that there could be a disproportionate effect um, on the minority employees. And I know that you will continue to um, make sure that you address any of, of those outcomes the best that you can. These are difficult times. Um, <clears throat> I think it's good for us to have these frank discussions and to keep it uh, really an intentional conversation as we go forward and, and everybody keep their innovative thinking uh, going because uh, uh, there will be unfortunate consequences here that will take a little bit of time for folks to catch up, <clears throat> it sounds like, and that's unfortunate. Um, but I'm hearing that 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 it will be there will be at least some, and I'm hoping that the numbers aren't as um, as large as we might imagine, given the impact on women at home with their children during this time. Thank thank you, Chair, and I, and I will I, I will sorry. say well, sorry I will say almost oh, that yes thank you your request um, the commission's request. To address this issue and you know, look into this has caused multiple productive um, and collaborative conversations internally um, where we've been 
you know, focused on the issue and strategizing. And, and so that, in, that in, in and of itself was, I think, beneficial. Um, so so I, I think to your point, an iterative process and being focused on it um, has, has great benefits. So um, we're happy to continue to have that dialogue. And, and I personally saw that there was some benefit of, of us even looking at it and discussing it um, in response to this dialogue, so thank you. Thank you, and, and I know that on our side, we are uh, making sure that we don't inadvertently create any barriers too. I've been assured that our licensing process doesn't um, impact your ability to bring people on quickly and swiftly and without um, uh, you know, extra burdens. So thank you. I know we have Jackie here, and, and um, North, I see you as well. Jackie, would you like to chime in? Good afternoon. You. Um, you know, possibly due to the differences in the way that uh, MGM and our property reopened, we haven't seen the same um, drop in numbers. In fact, our numbers have remained almost exactly identical. Our number of managers, women managers, uh, sorry, supervisors and above has actually gone up and we're now over the 50% mark. Um, anecdotally, when we first recalled uh, employees in July, we had a lot of employees that asked for a couple of weeks to rearrange their schedules, to try to figure out how to deal with whether they were living out of state, whether they were living with family, uh, whether they had uh, childcare issues. And so we did, we did provide that time to allow them to uh, adjust their schedules before returning. Um, we haven't had anyone uh, recently who has uh, said that they declined to come back uh, due to childcare issues. Uh, we do have a handful, two handfuls, I'd say, of employees who have um, asked if they can delay their return uh, because they live with people who are uh, in vulnerable situations. And so for those employees, uh, we have granted them a leave of absence, which we extend uh, sort of every 90 days uh, as to allow them to do that. Um, Again, we've, we've tried to, where we can, modify schedules uh, accordingly to allow people to work at different times if, if that's what's required. Uh, and of course, our work from home policy, which we didn't have before, uh, has allowed, uh, I think, some people to remain employed who otherwise might not have been able to do so. And thank you, and thank you for prefacing. I do know you have a different structure, so um, I, I appreciate, uh, Jackie, you, you noting that right up front. So that's all, all good news. Um, thank you. Uh, questions, uh, Commissioner O'Brien or Commissioner Cameron, would you like to go first? Hey, yes, this is Commissioner O'Brien, Jackie. Um, just can you uh, address sort of the way MGM did in terms of their collateral consequences to the person going on leave? Or did sure. they get to retain sort of their seniority status and anything else as if they were recall? They came back the first offer to recall? Sure, so for the people on leave, um, those people will come back with the same seniority. Uh, if there's people who have been terminated uh, because, and, and we have some departments where, where frankly, we, we, we need the people to come back. Uh, we're short people, we can't, uh, we can't operate them the way we need to without people returning. So if we, in those situations where we did have to terminate people because they couldn't come back uh, and, and weren't able to provide uh, a reason that we could assist with, um, those people uh, would lose their seniority if they, later came back, it later reapplied and, and did come back, the same as MGM. Not in terms of benefits, but in terms of bidding, yeah. Okay, and then when you say, because they couldn't provide a reason, that was, it, was there some sort of vetting process in terms of the reason for, for inability to come back? Oh, yes, we asked, we definitely asked the reasons why people come, uh, won't come back. Uh, frankly, most of them have left the state. Uh, their housing situations have changed. Uh, so th that seemed to be the primary reason why uh, people weren't coming back. Uh, again, anecdotally, we didn't see a lot, we didn't see any, uh, anyone who said they, they couldn't come back because of childcare. Okay, or other COVID-related responsibilities? The, the only ones that the, the COVID-related responsibilities were those people who were living with a vulnerable family member. And so for those eight individuals, we did put them on a leave of absence. On leave. Okay, great, thank you. Could I just ask a real quick question I didn't ask before um, staff this, the child care facility in Springfield, has that been going or functioning during the COVID? Is that able to reopen? You may not know the answer. I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, 
Um, I don't know for sure, but I believe that it is. Probably with the restrictions of uh, maybe some reductions in uh, occupancy. And then Jackie, did you, um, your child care provisions? We are open finally. So they were able to open uh, in the middle of COVID. I shouldn't say in the middle, in, in the last six months. And uh, we rolled it out first to our employees. And unfortunately, uh, their total capacity is 64, but they're only able to enroll 18 students. Oh, sorry, 18, uh, in, eight infants and 10 uh, toddlers, toddlers at this time. Yeah. Commissioner Bryan, how did we fail to ask about the childcare facility? That's usually the first question we would ask, Jackie. It's going to be in my quarterly report, so yeah. I'm very pleased. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was saving that for my, my last question. I like to Oh, okay, that. great. No, I'm joking. No, um, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, or, um, uh, do you have a question for Jackie? And, and, and Commissioner O'Brien, I don't know if you, were, if you were all finished. Are you all set? Commissioner Cameron? I don't have a question, but I, I thank Jackie for the report. And Commissioner Zinnica? Same here. Thank you, Jackie. Okay, and now, Nora, nice to see you. Yes. Now, I didn't ask North to have anything uh, really prepared, so I just had him here for questions. But of course, North, if you do have uh, some words to say, would be happy to hear them. Well, we don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, if you if you have if you'd like to report, we're we're welcome to. We're all ears. I, I I think I would just say you know Kathy is here to be able to answer some of the specific questions we may have. We haven't made any structural changes to our workforce uh, since my time in joining. Um, I, I will say that when this issue came up on a couple meetings ago, obviously, you know, I could tell that it was a concern of the commission. And so I immediately walked down to Kathy's office. We had a discussion about our employment practices, making sure that, you know, we have fair employment practices, that we are uh, making efforts to recall team members who had left us uh, for, for whatever reason. Um, who were employed with us prior to the pandemic starting, and that we weren't placing any undue burdens on team members as they uh, potentially sought to come back, and that we were kind of continuing that conversation with them. Because people's lives change, circumstances change, all those types of things, uh, it, it's a very fluid time. Uh, and I walked away very satisfied with, with where we were. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have, but I, I, don't, I do not have concerns about um, this issue right now. And, and I would just add that um, it's, it's almost been a year now when we initially fur furloughed our team members and we worked um, hand in hand with um, the unions to ensure that we could put, um, you know, uh, MOAs in place that would protect um, members that were being furloughed at the time um, and since laid off and terminated, um, extending, um, you know, their uh, ability for recall and for retaining their status for a period that was outside the original agreements. I think, um, you know, oh, I think Wendy shared earlier, this was, you know, the, the, the current contracts or the past contracts didn't have any provisions in there for that. So um, we did a, we made sure that we put that into place. I think the other thing that, that we've done over the last um, six to seven months when, when we recalled the positions that we were able to open up, um, you know, because the, the restrictions allowed us to, um, we, we brought back everyone and offered, and we did also offer team members who were either uncomfortable at the time returning for their own personal reasons or family reasons, the opportunity to pass and then be recalled within a 30 day period. Um, we've done that for, most of the departments for pretty much all of the departments that have been brought back we have um exhausted the list of members that we can return to work we've actually even had some turnover in certain areas we have um, opened up the opportunity for team members who might have been either laid off at the time or furloughed at the time to um, have first right to interview for positions that were not necessarily theirs. Um, we've had a lot of success with that. We've um, probably back, probably brought back over 30 or so team members into roles that um, were either roles that they had done in the past or roles that were new to them. 
so that we could go to our, our team members who were out first. Um, we, on a weekly basis, um, update our um, postings. And so with that, we share that via email to team members um, at least once a month, um, any positions that we hope have open um, because everyone, you know, while we say you can go to the website, everyone doesn't. So we make sure that we, we share them um, on our employee website and then also via emails to, to give um, team members opportunities or laid off or terminated team members opportunity to apply for positions that they might have interest or had experience in. I think for us, um, our, our biggest area of opportunity for bringing back um, team members will come when we're able to open up Flutie's, which is um, the larger restaurant on property um, that will allow us to bring back um, servers and um, front of the house employees and culinary employees, which is a large pop, which is, you know, largely populated by females. Also, when we're able to open up our lounges, um, we have uh, four areas where the primary bartenders and um, uh, servers there are also um, female. So we're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to do that by June. And again, um, we did not, in our um, responses or our calls, get the um, responses back that people were not returning because of children. And I think you remember as we were bringing in um, care.com to, to help us with our employees, um, the, bigger, uh, the bigger need for us was not child care, but elder care. So um, we don't see that as a barrier right now. What we see um, is the barrier for us holding back the, the, the return of um, yeah, some sure. of the female members is the opportunity to open up our lounges, our banquets, and foodies. Thank you, um, very helpful. And, and Joe, you didn't need to ask them. They were more than prepared, so thank you. Um, uh, thank you for uh, the thorough reports from all three facilities. In so many ways, you're, you're so similar. And in other ways, you do have different um, um, obligations, which you know we see here today. I think, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, you're going to—I know that you'll want to see reporting going forward. We'll have the next quarterly reports coming up. Um, Joe would be for and like I, what what month are we in right now? Um, we'll, we'll probably have those reports uh, probably the first and second meetings in May. Yeah. So we look forward to hearing um, um, the reports and, and we also thank you for taking this uh, issue so seriously. Commissioners, are we all set? Yeah, I do. I just, I wanna reiterate that to say thank you to the three licensees, um, particularly the conversations. Um, I know MGM, sometimes it's hard to go first. So thank you for stepping up and being the first one to talk um, and to know that this has been taken seriously and that there've been conversations about how to address it. Um, and I, I look forward to continuing the conversation as we go. As always, we appreciate um, uh, the continued uh, collaboration and cooperation, and particularly, you know, during this really challenging time. So thank you. I think then um, if, um, we'll move on to um, our next item. Um, Ma number Madam, six. Oh, yeah, sorry. Madam, I just wanted to check in because we do have the um, executive schedule session scheduled in about seven minutes, but that's obviously no. going to be delayed. Or no, they're not. They're this? not scared, scheduled for them. They're scheduled oh, okay. one forty-five. So I, I okay. think we're going to continue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, though. Uh, we're going to continue with an eye on the on the uh, the time. I'd like to get through as much as we can of the next items and. Uh, um, to Todd if we have to buy 15 minutes. Um, I don't know if I need to buy a vowel or, or what it is, but um, we might need 15 minutes, so. Um, I think everyone is here who is going to be part of the executive session, so. Yeah, and, and also for our outside, uh, there won't well, be any, oh, everyone he here. It's just will, the licensees, so that's they're, right. all, so they're all here. They, they will probably want to have them a, a, a bite of something as well, so thank you. Um, Chair, I'll make sure that I keep in touch with them as things move forward, if, if things get delayed in any fashion. Yeah, you, thank you so much. 
I appreciate it. So we'll continue and, and to our team, Karen, I'll um, appreciate your, your time keeping up very much. So item number six, um, Loretta, please, um, Director Lilios. Uh, sure, uh, hi, hi again. And there the first are. item is 6A, which is uh, the presentation of the uh, investigative findings on a qualifier for MGM and Senior Enforcement Council. Kate Hart again will uh, present those findings to you. Thank you. Good good afternoon, Kate. Good afternoon. It's nice to you all. Uh, I do have a presentation for you today on Mr. John Newman. He's a for MGM. Um, and he is uh, up for your consideration today by way of background. Uh, Mr. Newman has submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. The IEB conducted its complete uh, protocol for suitability for casino qualifiers and confirmed financial stability and integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, verified that no limited political contributions were made in Massachusetts, and conducted checks of open source law enforcement databases. The team of investigators assigned to this background investigation and joining us on the call today was Trooper David Collette of the Massachusetts State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit and Financial Investigator Paul Eldridge. On February 17th, 2021, Mr. Newman was interviewed using virtual technology by Trooper Collette and also by Investigator Eldridge. Uh, Trooper Collette was present at the Massachusetts Gaming Commission uh, headquarters located here at Federal Street in Boston, and uh, Paul Eldridge joined using remote technology as well. Uh, Mr. Newman was cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of the investigation. Mr. Newman was born and raised in Jackson, Tennessee, and in 1999, at the age of 17, he joined the United States Air Force. During his enlistment, he served as an information technology specialist. And after four years with the Air Force, Mr. Newman joined the Army as a warrant officer. Mr. Newman then spent the next seven years in the Army as a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. Mr. Newman spent time in Germany, Iraq, and ultimately in Washington, DC, and also served as his unit's IT officer. After his discharge from active duty, Mr. Newman returned to the U.S. civilian contractor and continued his IT career. Mr. Newman served as the Director of Operations for the U.S. Army Cyber Command in Germany, which focused on the U.S. Army's Information Security Program. Mr. Newman remained in this position for three years before leaving government service in 2014. In 2015, Mr. Newman started the next phase of his career with Merck, a large pharmaceutical company, where he served in Germany as the company's head of global information security. After three and a half years with Merck in 2019, Mr. Newman took a position with Adidas, uh, an international clothing company with which you may be familiar. He was the Vice President of Information Security at Adidas. He remained with Adidas for only a year and a half before he was awarded his current position as the Chief Information Security Officer for MGM Resort International in September of 2020. Uh, Mr. Newman's day-to-day -day responsibilities with MGM Resorts International include developing and executing the company's information security strategy in line with the company's overall goals and risk appetite. He also has a strong focus on maintaining the company's compliance with all gaming regulations regarding information security across all of the company's IT platforms. He currently has four direct reports with approximately 55 other employees. Uh, underneath uh, that reporting structure. They are spread across a few of MGM's US properties, uh, including MGM Springfield, and he stated that he reports directly to MGM's general counsel, Mr. John McManus. Uh, Mr. Newman uh, does not uh, foresee a great deal of travel, uh, potentially regarding the COVID environment. However, um, he will visit MGM properties as needed, including Springfield, uh, and intends to do so after the conclusion of COVID-19 and the pandemic restrictions. The remaining background review confirmed that uh, Mr. Newman attended Park University in Parkville, Missouri, availing himself of a program available to members of the United States Armed Services. He completed the program in May of 2002 and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Management and Computer Information Systems. He then uh, undertook a similar program to achieve a master's degree from Webster University in Webster Groves, Missouri, and he achieved that master's degree in December of 2010. Mr. Newman is new to the gaming industry and is currently the subject of several suitability investigations, including an investigation here in Massachusetts, um, and he is the subject of those investigations due to the nature of his position uh, with MGM as their chief of information security. Mr. Newman has demonstrated to the IEB that by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable, and the IEB recommends that the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for MGM Springfield. And 
hear any questions from the commissioners, uh, my investigative team is present and we're happy to answer them. Thank, thank you, Kate. Uh, I am seeing Paul. Um, so thank you, Paul. Uh, but I'm sorry I missed the, the, um, the other investigator. It was and I'm, I'm hoping he was able to join um, at least a part of the yeah. meeting today. It's hard for me to see him maybe on another that, page. That, that's okay. Um, I just couldn't. I'm. I'm. That's okay. I just couldn't, that's okay. I just couldn't hear the name Paul again. And, and I do believe he's on the call, but um, in he's not a typical fashion. You know, he's here. I'm sure he's able to. Uh, we'll jump in if there's any questions. Um, yeah. Loretta, I'm so you. sorry. I don't have the report in front of me and I didn't make the notation. I'm missing the name altogether. Uh, um, of the investigator? Uh, it's the uh, Dave Collette. Oh, right. thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, so thank you to, to Collette and, uh, and, um, and Paul. Uh, and of course, I, I want to just note that uh, this is um, an applicant with significant service to our country. We um, thank him very much for that. Questions? Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Cameron, I would be remiss not to turn to you first on this. No, I, I, I don't have questions. It's a very, um, very well done report without any problematic uh, issues. And you mentioned um, the, the applicant service. I also find it impressive that while serving uh, our country, he completed an undergraduate and a graduate degree. That is impressive. Yes. Commissioner Zuniga, you're nodding your head. I think we all came away with that observation. Commissioner Zuniga? No, thank you. No questions. Really uh, well done. Thank you to uh, the team. Commissioner O'Brien? No, no questions at all. It's very clear from the report. And I'll borrow Commissioner Cameron's usual language, very clean report. Thank you. Always thorough. Um, and so, you know, you continue to um, impress us with, with uh, the thoroughness and uh, to the whole team. Thank you so much. I do know that you need a, there's a recommendation made here for suitability. Um, we need a, a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to move. Um, the commission issue a positive determination of suitability for senior vice president john newman um, he is the senior vice president chief information officer to mbm resorts international second any further comments or questions loretta are you all set all set thank you okay roll call vote then on this report again kate thank you commissioner cameron aye Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zinica? Aye. I vote yes, 4 0. Thank you, Tanya, so much. And then, um, and Kate, thank you. Um, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and, and now thank we. Thank you to the team. Yes, yes. And now we move on to um, uh, 6B, um, Director Lilios. Sure. So I wanted to report to you that last week the IEB issued a civil administrative penalty to MGM uh, relating to three underage instance in incidents that occurred on December 25th, December 31st, and January 20th. Uh, the penalty was in the amount of $18,000 and MGM agreed to this amount to address the three violations. All of the incidents shared a somewhat common fact pattern, each involved an underage person, age 17, 18, and 20, being in the gaming area. Each actually gamed, and in one instance, uh, the individual was served a, uh, an alcoholic beverage. On the December 25th incident, uh, the uh, involving a 17-year-old, Security did not request identification at the checkpoint entrance, even though the protocol is the patron lowers the mask and uh, security requ is required to ask for uh, identification from anyone who appears under 30. Uh, so this lapse was not acceptable. Uh, also, the individual did have interaction on the gaming floor with multiple casino employees, but none requested his ID, and the individual was served. This was the one uh, with the alcoholic, alcoholic beverage. Um, 
the person was on the floor for about two hours, actively gamed at a slot machine for a short period of time, about one to two minutes. It was the uh, cage cashier who alerted security uh, um, when he was ready to cash out. On the December 31st incident, this 18 year old was involved and again, security did not check ID at the checkpoint entrance. This person was on the floor for approximately two hours, gamed at 11 slot machines for about one and a half hours and interacted with a number of casino personnel. Ultimately a cocktail server requested ID and security responded. On the January 20th incident, a 20-year-old gained entry. Uh, ID was requested at the checkpoint entrance. The Veridoc system showed that the person's ID failed at the checkpoint entry, but the person was allowed to enter. Anyway, again, not acceptable. This person was on the gaming floor for about a half an hour, played, uh, I think, three games of blackjack without the dealer asking for the ID and ultimately security uh, arrived. I did want to point out a few things about this enforcement action uh, taken uh, by the IEB. So you're all aware the well-being of underage is of paramount concern under 23K. The commission also has identified compliance around underage issues to be a priority. Uh, in the past, MGM had issues with compliance in this area, was previously assessed a fine for underage violations about two years ago in May of 2019. The fact that controls at the security entrance checkpoint in each incident occurred, but entry was still allowed, you know, as I said, is, is just uh, not ex unacceptable failures. We usually look at interactions with casino staff on floor on the floor as problematic if IDs are not requested. But in fairness, on this factor, uh, that was really complicated by I think the wearing of masks, and you know that posed a, a challenge uh, to staff on the floor. So I did want to to recognize that. Uh, you know, another factor uh, that we looked at was that the individuals were on the floor for a calculable period of time, ranging on the low end of half an hour to uh, up to approximately two hours. And the fact that each of them actually gamed, and in one instance with a table game dealer interaction, and in another instance, you know, alcohol served. Um, so all of those were factors that led the IEB to respond to these breaches uh, with a uh, civil administrative penalty. I did also want to point out some other pieces of information that informed the uh, calculus here. Uh, I mentioned a, a prior uh, penalty uh, about two years ago, but in that period between then and, and now, there has been consistent significant improvement, and this is not a chronic problem uh, at MGM. So I wanted to be sure to, to point that out. In each instance, MGM reported these incidents to the IEB in real time, which allowed GEU to respond along with security in each instance. MGM immediately put into place measures uh, and did things like you started immediately using their pre-shift meetings to re-emphasize the steps outlined in their internal controls and their policy of requesting, uh, requiring IDs from anyone who uh, looks under 30. And they promptly took uh, human resources disciplinary steps uh, internally as well. The adoption of the nationally accredited TRIPS training program was underway at the same time of these incidents. Previously, the company had been using their own MGM training module, but the accredited TIPS version has been adopted company-wide now. The TIPS training has been rolled out. Current staff, returning staff, new hires are all required uh, to take it. Um, the internal controls requirements are reiterated uh, at pre-shift meetings now. Uh, the compliance director continues to hold weekly operational meetings with division heads and with legal um, at MGM to discuss any incidents uh, that occur. 
Um, and uh, they are in the process of expanding the installation of handrails around the perimeter of the gaming area to address access by miners to their unique gaming floor. And that didn't, wasn't actually part of the uh, issues in these three incidents. You know, each of the uh, people did come through security, but you know, in a greater um, uh, review, you know, they are doing the, the expanding the handrail uh, system. So the response of MGM, in my view, has been you know, very responsible. They certainly re uh, recognize the importance uh, of this. They did not make any excuses whatsoever in any of the discussions about these uh, violations. They took immediate action uh, on their own and they have uh, treated it very seriously. Um, so, wanted to update you on, on, the, uh, on the uh, penalty. Um, certainly happy to try to answer any questions that you might uh, have about it. Commissioners, um, let's see. Commissioner Zuniga, I'll turn to you first. Um, yeah, no questions. Just thank you for that uh, thorough report and, um, and all the work you do. Uh, it sounds like um, there's some uh, um, challenges, um, you know, presented by the pandemic, but again, um, the, the collective response by you and MGM in this case um, appears to be a great step towards, towards that. Commissioner uh, O'Brien or Commissioner Cameron, who would like to go next? Give me a I'll wave. jump in. Um, Thanks, Commissioner Cameron. Thank you, Director Lilios. Um, I think the penalty is entirely appropriate. This is such a serious issue, but I also appreciate you explaining mitigating circumstances. But I do believe that um, a penalty does force greater vigilance around these issues. Um, and I am happy to see that uh, MGM has taken the issue very seriously and, um, and taken steps to remediate. Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, Director Lilios, I'm assuming that the security personnel that did not ask for ID were different individuals or was it the same individual? Uh, uh, different individuals. Okay, for each time? Uh, uh, th that's right, there were different individuals each time and uh, on, a, on two, I think the first two occasions, they were on each occasion two security guards at the posting, you know, so that was also part of the calculus too. Uh, but it, they weren't the same person repeated. And then when it failed in the machine, was it failed because they weren't 21 or did it fail saying not a valid ID? Not a valid. Okay. Not a valid. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely think the finding is appropriate. Um, and I, I would hope and expect I'll to see if you're in this situation again a couple of years out that the number would go up in terms of the monetary sanction. Um, but I, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of the, um, the history of improvement and then the, the masking maybe contributing to this. But I certainly hope that not only the TIPS training, but you know, reminding them that there's a, a requirement, an affirmative obligation to have them pull the mask, have the person pull the mask down um, to a card is part of the remediation process here. Right. Thank you, Director Lilios. I'm all set. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Th thank you so much. Um, moving on then to the item number seven, please. On the Good raising morning. division. Good morning, commissioners. Good afternoon, Dr. Good afternoon. Actually, yes, afternoon. <laughs> So our uh, first um, item um, is a request by um, Pine Ridge for um, approval of their uh, racing officials and key personnel. Uh, Steve O'Toole, their director of racing, is here today. Um, one thing on um, the list of people, he would like to add Paul Verrett as a backup judge. He is on the list as their racing secretary, and um, he has uh, served as a backup judge in the past. So if it's okay to add him to the list today and and vote on him as well, that'd be great. Um, all of these people uh, have been working in these uh, same capacities in the past and have been licensed by us. And um, so my recommendation is to approve them all. Any questions? 
I'm sure everybody got to see um, the documents in the packet. So you're saying, could you just repeat the name? Uh, Paul Verrett. Okay, he's, thank you. He's on the list as um, racing secretary. And then he's also, um, they're asking to be able to use him as a backup judge. Backup judge, he had, thank you. He has you. done that for him in the past and we approved him in that capacity last year. Thank you, I'm having a little bit of Zoom hearing, I think, so thank you. Thank you for the clarification. So with that, commissioners, we would want, um, I, I know that uh, Dr. Lightbound needs a vote. Um, and I also uh, see that um, uh, Mr. O'Toole, you're here. Thank you, Director O'Toole. Um, uh, do I have a motion with the uh, proper um, amendment? Madam Chair, I'll, I'll be happy to move that the commission approve uh, the request from uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino uh, for the um, operating personnel and racing officials as included in the packet and as uh, modified by Director, Director Lightbaum um, here today. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for Dr. Lightbound? I'll send in Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zinnica? Aye. And I vote yes, so four zero. Thank you. Um, moving on to your next item, uh, Alex. So our next uh, item is a request by Plain Ridge to, for a waiver of the um, qualifying race requirement, 205 CMR 312 number six. Um, this has been done, um, asked for, and the commission has approved it for the last three years without any incident. And um, it just extends the number of days that a horse can be off from 30 days to 45 days. Um, the qualifiers are important as a way of assessing the fitness and soundness of the horses. And also um, it provides a line or two for the betting public. Um, so again, um, I recommend that the commission approve this and it does take a vote. Any questions for Dr. Lightbaum? Commissioner Cameron, do you have a motion? Or does somebody do. have a motion? Thank I, you. I move that the commission approve the request of Plain Ridge Park Casino for a waiver from the 30-day requirement described in 205 CMR 3.127 and instead require that all horses not showing a satisfactory racing uh, line during the previous 45 days um, go to a qualifying mile in a race before the judges. Second. I have a question, is it 2-6 or 2-7? Uh, we're two with the um, CMR. Yeah. It's six. You said seven, six. but it's six, right? I think you said seven. I wonder oh, if it's I'm just, a, oh, there might've been a typo in the, the a yeah. typo. okay. Seven. I'm, I'm sorry, it is six, thank you. I think it's actually seven, but it says six in the memo. Okay, so. Oh. I, so the original language is correct, as moved, right? Thank okay. you. Motion, right. motion is done, yep. No amendment needed. Thank you so much for the clarification. Excellent. Um, and then we have a second from Commissioner Zuniga. So no further questions? Um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes, four zero. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you, Dr. Lightbound. Uh, and thank you, Steve. Good to see you. Um, I am, our next item is, is number eight. Do any of my fellow commissioners have an item? I have a single one. Um, uh, I've asked Commissioner O'Brien to uh, take a look at the new police reform bill or well, law that goes into effect in July, working with them. Um, I didn't really want to pile on to our very busy legal staff right now to take a preliminary review of that law to see if the IEB is considered a law enforcement agency for the purposes of that law. Um, we happen to have a broad definition in our in our statute, and there's a very broad definition in that new law. So um, it could well be that the IEB is not implicated, but if it is, 
there might be some obligations that we need to line up um, in advance before the July 1 effective date. So Commissioner O'Brien, uh, it's not intended to be a heavy lift, but sort of preliminary uh, feedback that you might even wanna check in with the AG's office or a &K or whomever, but uh, just to see if we have to explore this further with um, Director Lilios and team, and of course our legal team. Karen, are you all set with that? Yes, that's fine. Okay, good, good. Um, then, and is there any other business that we've neglected from you, Karen? Anything that we you need from us? Nothing for today. Okay, so um, the next um, the next piece of business we're about at one twenty. I do have to um, address the what we anticipate to be executive sessions, and we will need a roll call vote on each of them. Um, and the commission by majority vote determines whether in fact we will go into executive session. But I do, I believe Todd, I must write, read the language um, precisely. So the commission anticipates that it will meet in executive session in accordance with GL chapter 30A, section 21A7 to comply with GL chapter 23K, section 21A7 for the specific purpose of reviewing the past and future capital expenditures uh, described in, in, in our regulation 205 CMR 1309 <clears throat> and any corresponding submitted multi-year plans relative to Plainridge Park Casino as discussion of this matter in public would frustrate the purpose of the statute and associated legal authorities. This matter is further governed by 205 CMR 139.02. The public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of this executive session. Are there any questions for Todd or others? I see no. I will leave then a, a motion. Madam Chair, I move that the commission um, meet in executive session for the purpose that it was ready. Second. Thank you. A roll call vote then. I'm assuming no further discussion. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. 4-0, Tanya. Then we move on item number 11. Again, I must read the language in, into the record. The commission anticipates will require again a, a roll call vote that it will meet in executive session in accordance with GL chapter 30A Section 21A7 to comply with GL Chapter 23K, Section 21A7 for the specific purpose of reviewing the past and future capital expenditures described in 205 CMR 139.09 and any corresponding submitted multi year plans relative to Encore Boston Harbor, as discussion of this matter in public would frustrate the purpose of the statute and associated legal authorities. This matter is further governed by 205 CMR 139.02. The public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of this executive session. Any questions for Todd again on this? Okay, and we do need a roll call vote as I mentioned. You might need first a motion. Uh, yes, please. I'm sure, which I'm happy to make. Uh, I move that the commission uh, convene in executive session for the purpose that you just outlined. Thank you, Commissioner. Second. Sir. Thank you. Um, assuming no further questions, a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, 4-0, Tanya. And then um, item number 12. The commission anticipates that it will meet in executive session in accordance with GL chapter 30A section 21A7 to comply with GL chapter 23K section 21A7 for the specific purpose of reviewing the past and future capital expenditures described in 205 CMR 139.09 and any corresponding submitted multi-year plans relative to MGM Springfield as discussion of this matter in public would frustrate the purpose of the statute and associated legal authorities. This matter is further governed by 205 CMR 139.02.
public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. And I will need a motion in order if, to move into that executive session. I will be happy to make it three for three, uh, Madam Chair. And I move that the commission um, convene in executive session for the purpose that you just read into the vote. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Um, and yes, batting a thousand. Um, take a roll call vote, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. Um, so that's four zero, Tanya. Now the way that this works um, virtually um, is that um, I will now informally adjourn this virtual meeting and um, I'll have to press a button that has us leave. Um, we do need to take a break. Uh, so our time right now is 1.25. Uh, Todd, I think I flagged perhaps a two o'clock start. Would that make sense for everyone? Give us a bit of a break. Um, I think we ran quite well on time and I thank everyone for being cognizant of the timing. It was a substance filled meeting um, as they all seem to be. Um, so we'll reconvene at two. I'm gonna thank everyone and then I'll press this awkward leave button. Um, and then we will reconvene in another virtual meeting room um, um, in, a, in, a, in um, the order of the three events, of the three um, items that we just um, went over. So again, for all those who participated today on the members of the team, for the members of the team who listened, um, well, maybe they worked, we always appreciate your attendance um, and, and uh, most of all appreciate all the work that you're doing uh, um, under uh, Executive Director Wells' leadership. So thank you. And um, we, will, we will see you all soon. Um, and for those who attended today as guests, thank you so much. <laughs>